Thank you. A uh, couple process issues to start. Um, the secretary has said that uh, he can be here till three, um, which calls calls into question, you know, just how big of a masochist he is. But we do appreciate um, the, the the ability to to be here that long. We are going to take a break at 12:15, from 12:15 to 12:30, uh, and then we'll resume. Uh, we don't have to go to three o'clock, um, but we want to try to give members as much time as possible, understanding the importance of this hearing. Uh, with that. Uh, call the hearing to order. I want to thank the Honorable Patrick Shanahan, Acting Secretary of Defense, uh, General Joseph Dunford, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Honorable David Norquist, who is performing the duties of the Deputy Secretary of Defense. First note, I believe this will be the last, uh, probably the last time that uh, General Dunford testifies before our committee. Um, he has held, held many roles within the military, and I just want to say on, on a personal note, it has been a great pleasure working with you. Um, you have served your country incredibly well, do an outstanding job, and we've always had a very open dialogue. Um, we all know that there are tensions between the Pentagon and Congress, uh, but you have done an outstanding job of truly you know, letting us know you care what we think, you want to work with us, you want to make this process work. I really appreciate your leadership. Um, and uh, Mr. Shanahan and Mr. Norquist, this is about your, your first hearings and your, and your current acting roles, as I discussed um, with the Secretary yesterday. Um, there's getting to be sort of a, a Bud Selig joke here. For those of you who follow baseball, he was made, he was made the um, baseball uh, chairman, and then he was the, the acting uh, chairman for, for life, because uh, he kept in that spot, but they never made him permanent. So we're hoping that doesn't ha happen in, in your case as well, but we appreciate your service uh, and look forward to your testimony. Um, these are, as always, very challenging times, as we've said on this committee for quite Few, few years now, um, it's hard to imagine a time in American history when we have had such a complex threat environment. Uh, certainly there have been times in our history where we've been at greater peril, uh, but here the dangers come from a multitude of different sources, and it really takes a, a, an incredible amount of work and understanding to figure out how do we meet all of those threats in a comprehensive way. We cannot do everything we would like to do. How do we make sure we do what we have to do? Um, so we have to meet that threat environment. Um, and the basic task, as I see it, of the Department of Defense and our committee is, number one, clearly, meet our national security objectives, figure out what they are, and make sure we are meeting them. Um, and one of the biggest there is to deter our adversaries. And that can come in many forms. At the moment, it's primarily Russia, China, transnational terrorist groups, North Korea, and Iran. What are we doing to deter them uh, from their actions? And then lastly, and most importantly, is to make sure that the men and women who serve in our military are trained and equipped and 100% prepared to carry out whatever mission we ask them to do. Um, those missions will change as the threat environment changes, as our resources change. But the one thing we never want to do is create a situation where we're asking them to go into a fight that they're not prepared for. Uh, we are incredibly well served by the men and women in our military. Without question, the best, strongest, most capable military in the history of the world. And it wouldn't happen but for the people serving. We need to make sure that we, we give them the tools they need to do their job. As I go forward, the, the greatest challenge to all of this is somewhat you know, surprising in that it's, it's the budget uh, and the uncertainty that comes with it. Ever since the Budget Control Act in 2011, the entire discretionary budget has gone through a number of shutdowns. At this point, I forget if it was three or four. Um, countless other threatened shutdowns countless continuing resolutions, and a level of budget uncertainty that had made it impossible to plan. From one month to the next, you do not know how much money you're going to have, and you don't know where you're going to be able to spend it. And that created an enormous number of problems. Now, we, we have made progress on that. We also, because of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, had a readiness shortfall, which I know you have worked very hard on and is getting better. We look forward to hearing the specifics about how we've improved on that. And then also, when we got the budget deal for 2018 and 2019, we finally put in about 18 months of, well, certainty is too strong a word, but predictability. Now, 2018 wasn't perfect because you didn't get it until six months into the fiscal year and then had to figure out how to, to spend that money um, in a very short time frame. But for 2019, on October 1, the Department of Defense 
knew what its budget was going to be for the full year. And I believe that was the first time in seven years that that was the case. Um, that is enormously helpful. Now, unfortunately, as we head towards 2020, uh, we are now at risk of falling back into the old ways, which is really too bad. We have, we have two years left on the Budget Control Act. And I know there is bipartisan consensus in the House and the Senate to get a deal for those last two years. Unfortunately, the budget that was submitted by the President and the Department of Defense dramatically undercuts our ability to get that deal. First of all, it sticks, well, it, it, it claims to stick to the Budget Control Act numbers, um, but it does two things that are incredibly problematic. One, it cuts all non-defense discretionary money by 5%, and that's by 5% below the Budget Control Act number for 2020. Uh, it's an even greater cut from what we put into those programs last year. And then it uses the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund as a slush fund. It takes that money and says, because it's off budget, we can pump, I think it's well over $90 billion into base budgeting out of the OCO and claim that we have stuck to the Budget Control Act numbers. That is breathtakingly irresponsible. And no uh, greater authority on that subject than current Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney said exactly that. Now, he said it three years ago when he was a member of Congress and not trying to weasel his way around the budget problem as a Chief of Staff, but he made it clear that OCO should not be a way to sneak around the budget caps. And yet that is the heart and soul of the budget going forward. And there are a couple of problems with this, the biggest one of which that budget is not going to pass. There is bipartisan opposition to it, um, and I can assure you that the Democratic-controlled House is not going to pass a budget um, that creates a $174 billion OCO and guts every other aspect of funding. So how do we get back from there? How do we get to the point where we were, I believe, in November and December, where we were just this close to a budget deal for 2020 and 2021 that could give us a degree of certainty, uh, that could give us that predictability and get us to the end of the Budget Control Act. There is no good reason to do this. Artificially sticking to those budget caps has almost nothing to do with fiscal responsibility. I know that's the thought. Well, gosh, if we can say we stuck to the budget caps, we can claim that we're being fiscally responsible. The discretionary budget is 25% of the overall budget and has nothing to do with revenue. Um, it is only a tiny portion of our overall debt and deficit picture. And to jeopardize all of that, to get no particular gain on fiscal responsibility is, to my mind, incredibly irresponsible. And the last problem with all of this is we constantly talk in this committee about a whole of government approach. We have had many people from the Pentagon, most notably and most articulately, as is often the case, with Secretary Mattis, who said, if you're going to cut the State Department, you better give me more ammunition. State Department gets cut by 25% in this budget. Uh, development gets cut by just about the same. Homeland Security, every other piece of this whole of government approach gets gutted in this budget except to make sure that we can have a 10% or 8% or whatever it is, increase in military spending. And I just, I can't have people from the Pentagon come up here and, you know, wax uh, nostalgic about how much they love the State Department while we gut their budget. You know, a whole government approach requires that. And we get into a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we don't fund these other tools, and by the way, the military is not the only way to deter our adversaries. We can work with partners. We can use diplomacy. There are a ton of things we can do so that we don't have to rely on the blunt instrument of the U.S. military. But it will not work if we get that budget. Just two final points. I have to make you know, the, the comment that funding a border wall out of the Department of Defense is also unbelievably irresponsible. And I won't even get into the debate here about the wisdom of that border wall. Um, we can do that at another time. But what, whatever one feels about the border wall, to look at the Pentagon as sort of a piggy bank slash slush fund where you can simply go in and grab money for something when you need it really undermines the credibility of the entire DOD budget. Because if you've got five to 10 to $20 billion just lying around at the Pentagon for any particular purpose, then what does that say about whether or not you really need the money that you come up here telling us that you need? So this committee, and I think there's been bipartisan expression of this, is unalterably opposed to taking money out of DOD to fund the border wall. And in particular, well, I'll get into, I'll get into the reprogramming issue in my questions. Um, but the last point that we want to emphasize, um, the audit. 
we need the Pentagon to start spending the money more wisely than it has been spending. And I really uh, want to thank my partner on this committee, Ranking Member Thornberry, for his work even before he was chairman of the committee. His understanding of acquisition and procurement is second to none on this committee, and he has worked very, very hard to try to put legislation in to improve the efficiency, to make sure that we are spending the money wisely. Too much money has been wasted at the Pentagon. We need the audit. At a minimum, we need to know where you're spending your money. We don't know that. There's really no way to get to efficiency. So we're going to keep pushing on that. And then we need to get better about the, the systems that we fund. The F-35 is unbelievably over budget. Um, we have the, the, the aircraft carrier. Even now as it's delivered, it's having problems um, with, with elevators and launch systems. Um, the tanker, you know, they're, they're finding debris inside of the tanker from when it was made. There is just a lack of efficiency, and there are programs throughout the 90s, the Future Combats Program, that spent billions of dollars towards no particular end. Um, the Expeditionary Fighting Vehicle, where we spent $8 billion before deciding that we weren't actually going to build it. Um, I believe that the Pentagon could get by with a lot less money if we had a full audit and we spent that money better. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're moving in that direction. With that, I thank you for being here. I look forward to your testimony, and I yield to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Shanahan, welcome to the House Armed Services Committee. You uh, have met with the committee in other places and other capacities, but this is the first time you have testified in, in this way. So welcome, General Dunford and Mr. Norquist. Um, welcome back. Uh, General Dunford, I am not quite ready to uh, let you go yet. Um, so. Uh, just be warned that, that uh, you may be back in some way or another. Uh, given what the chairman said, the complex nature of uh, the threats and the security environment in, in which we all operate. Mr. Secretary, you may find yourself uh, the target of a lot of criticism uh, for decisions that you had nothing to do with today. Um, I hope that's not the case. I, uh, for example, share the chairman's view that we should not take Department of Defense resources and use it for other purposes. Uh, I know that that was not a decision you made, uh, but I hope that most of what we can talk about today are those things within the purview of the Department of Defense, because I agree with much of, of the chairman's comments that uh, budget uncertainty largely because of Congress and the previous administration has caused enormous problems for the Department of Defense and the men and women who serve. Uh, and yet we have started to make some real progress. We have started, had a good start in improving readiness of our forces uh, and all of us uh, who have, have been on the committee previously have been concerned about the number of casualties and other things because of accidents, which were unfortunately increasing at an alarming rate. It wasn't just because of, of the pace of operations. That certainly contributed, but it was also because of about a 20% cut in, in, in defense funding starting in, in 2010. We have started to make progress on improving our position versus peer competitors. Uh, now, we hadn't caught up where we need to be yet, but, um, but it, and in key areas, they're still ahead of us, but we've started to make progress. And we've even started to make progress in treating our people right. Uh, I think you're going to, for example, this committee is going to focus on housing issue. Uh, there's some spouse employment issues. There's still a lot of things we need to do. But, but when you look back the last few years on pay, health care, retirement, et cetera, um, we have started to make progress. My bottom line is we need to keep making progress. We can't slide backwards. And uh, I am very conscious of the fact that repeatedly Secretary Mattis and you, General Dumford, have testified that a minimum of 3 to 5 percent real growth in the defense budget is necessary to continue to make progress both on readiness and in, 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 uh, holding our own, at least, with peer competitors. Uh, I also note that the National Strategy Commission, which was composed of an equal number of Republicans and Democrats, uh, looked at this for some time, and they endorsed that 3 to 5% real growth. 
Uh, that's exactly what the president's budget, or just about what the president's budget comes in at. Uh, I share the concerns about other parts of the budget, and I completely agree we're not ever going to pass a $174 billion OCO, but that goes back to decisions that were made somewhere else other than the Department of Defense. Uh, I appreciate all three of you uh, and the work that you put in. We need to be your partners to continue to make progress on readiness, on tr pe treating our people right, on uh, the peer competitor issues that concern us all. So we'll get into a lot of those today. Thank you all again for being here. I yield back. Mr. Secretary. Oops, there we are. Good. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Thornberry, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of the President's budget request for fiscal year 2020. I am joined by Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph Dunford, and the Department's Controller and Chief Financial Officer, Mr. David Norquist. It has been a great privilege and honor to serve alongside the men and women of the Department of Defense, and it was a pleasure to work with Secretary Mattis to craft the 2018 National Defense Strategy. Released in January, 2018, that strategy laid the foundation for restoring military readiness and modernizing our joint force for an era of great power competition. I now oversee the continued execution of that strategy, which is the undisputed driver of today's budget request. It was extremely helpful for the department to receive authorization and appropriation bills on time and at the requested top line last year. With 80 seven percent of Congress in bipartisan support last year marked the earliest signing of an authorization bill in four decades. The strategy you supported last year is the same strategy we are asking you to fund this year. The $750 billion top line for national defense enables DOD to maintain irregular warfare as a core competency yet prioritizes modernization and readiness to compete, deter, and win in any possible high-end fight of the future. This budget is critical for the continued execution of our strategy, and it reflects difficult but necessary decisions that align finite resources with our strategic priorities. To highlight some of those decisions, this is the largest research, development, testing, and evaluation budget in 70 years. The budget includes double-digit increases to our investments in both space and cyber, modernization of our nuclear triad and missile defense capabilities, and the largest shipbuilding request in 20 years when adjusted for inflation. It also increases our total end strength by roughly 7,700 7, service members and provides a 3.1% pay increase to our military the largest in a decade. Now to the specifics. The top line slates $718 billion for the Department of Defense. Of that total, the budget includes 545 for base funding and 164 billion for overseas contingency operations. Of the overseas contingency operation funds, 66 billion will go to direct war and enduring requirements and 98 billion will fund base requirements. To round out the numbers, $9.2 billion will fund emergency construction. That includes an estimated $2 billion to rebuild facilities damaged by Hurricanes Florence and Michael, up to $3.6 billion to support military construction projects that will be awarded in fiscal year 2020 instead of fiscal year 2019, so we can resource border barrier projects under emergency declaration this year and $3.6 billion in case additional emergency funding is needed for the border. Military construction on the border will not come at the expense of our people, our readiness, or our modernization. To identify the potential pool of sources of military construction funds, DOD will apply the following criteria. No military construction projects that have already been awarded, 
and no military construction projects with fiscal year 2019 award dates will be impacted. We are solely looking at projects with award dates after September 30th, 2019. No military housing, barracks, or dormitory projects will be impacted. Decisions have not been made concerning which border barrier projects will be funded through Section 2808 authority. If the Department's FY 2020 budget is enacted on time as requested, no military construction project used to source Section 2808 projects will be delayed or canceled. I appreciate the inherent intra-government complexities of the Southwest border situation. I also want to emphasize the funds requested for the border barrier amount to less than 1% of the national defense top line. As this committee fully understands, no enemy in the field has done more damage to our military's combat readiness in years past than sequestration and budget instability. And there is no question today our adversaries are not relenting. The instability of a continuing resolution would cost us in three important ways. First, we would be unable to implement new initiatives like standing up the Space Command or accelerating our development of hypersonic capabilities and artificial intelligence. Second, our funding will be in the wrong accounts. We are requesting significant investments in RDT&E for cyber, space, and disruptive technologies, and in O&M for core readiness. Third, the incremental funding under a CR means we lose buying power. This translates to higher costs and uncertainty for industry and the communities where we operate. We built this budget to implement our national defense strategy, and I look forward to working with you to ensure predictable funding so our military can remain the most lethal, adaptable, and resilient fighting force in the world. I appreciate the critical role Congress plays to ensure our warfighters can succeed on the battlefield of both today and tomorrow. And I thank our service members, their families, and all those in the Department of Defense for maintaining constant vigilance as they stand, always ready to protect our freedoms. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Dunford. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Thornberry, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to join Secretary Shanahan and Under Secretary Norquist today. It remains my privilege to represent your soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. While much of our discussion this morning is going to focus on the challenges we face, it's important I begin by assuring you that your armed forces can deter a nuclear attack, defend the homeland, meet our alliance commitments, and effectively respond should deterrence fail. I believe today we have a competitive advantage over any potential adversary defined as the ability to project power and fight and win at the time and place of our choosing. But as members of this committee well know, 17 years of continuous combat and fiscal instability have affected our readiness and eroded the competitive advantage we enjoyed a decade or more ago. As the Secretary highlighted, China and Russia have capitalized on our distraction and restraints by investing in capabilities specifically designed to challenge our traditional sources of strength. After careful study, they've developed capabilities intended to contest our movement across all domains, sea, air, space, cyberspace, and land, and disrupt our ability to project power. With the help of Congress, starting in 2017, we began to restore that competitive advantage. Recent budgets have allowed us to build readiness and invest in new capabilities while meeting current operational commitments. But we cannot reverse decades of erosion in just a few years. This year's budget submission would allow us to continue restoring our competitive advantage by improving readiness and developing capabilities to enhance our lethality. It proposes investments in advanced capabilities across all domains, sea, air, land, space, and cyberspace. This year's budget also sustains investments in our nuclear enterprise to ensure a safe, secure, and effective strategic deterrent, the highest priority of the Department of Defense. We've also taken steps to more effectively employ the force we have today and build the force we need for tomorrow. We've implemented fundamental changes in our global force management process 
to prioritize and allocate resources in accordance with the national defense strategy while building readiness and the flexibility to respond to unforeseen contingencies. We've also refined our process for developing and designing the future force, a joint concept threat-informed threat approach supported by a wide body of analytic work allows us to more deliberately evaluate and prioritize warfighting requirements. This also enables us to pair emerging technologies with innovative operational concepts. In closing, I'd like to thank the committee for all we've done to support the men and women in uniform and their families. Together, we've honored the solemn obligation to never send our sons and daughters into a fair fight. And with your continued support, we never will. Thank you both. I appreciate that. Um, keeping in mind and acknowledging uh, Ranking Member Thornberry's point that you don't make the policy necessarily that you're, you're sent up here to defend. Regrettably, neither President Trump nor Chief of Staff Mulvaney are going to testify before our committee. So we have to ask you about it um, and get your defense slash explanation. And one of the biggest areas in the wall funding that's problematic for this committee and for the relationship between the Pentagon um, and Congress is the reprogramming requests. And it is, you know, a bit of sort of arcane policy that even I didn't fully understand. But by and large, the Pentagon is not allowed to simply move money from one account to another um, that without coming back through the full legislative process. But given the amount of money at the Pentagon and given how much things change, um, we have given through the congressional process the ability to reprogram, I think it was $4 billion last year. But one of the sort of gentlemen's agreements about that was if you reprogram money, you will not do it without first getting the approval of all four relevant committees, defense approaches in the House and the Senate and armed services in the House and the Senate. For the first time since we've done that on the reprogramming request to help fund the wall, basically you're, you're shifting money from the MILPERS account um, into the, yeah, forgive me, the drug, um, drug safety account, whatever it is, um, drug enforcement account, um, so that you can then take it out of the account and put it to the wall. And you are not asking for our permission. Now, you understand that the result of that likely is that the Appropriations Committee in particular would no longer give the Pentagon um, reprogramming authority. Now, I think that's unfortunate because they need it. Um, and I guess my, my question is, what was the discussion like about in deciding to break that rule, and what is your view of the implications for it going forward in terms of the relationship between the Pentagon and Congress in general, and specifically, how much is it going to hamper you to not have reprogramming authority after this year? Chairman, what was the second part of that? There was the dis what was the discussion? How, how's it how's it going to hamper uh, the relationship the, if you? Yeah, oh, sorry, how is it going to hamper your ability to do your job if you yeah. don't have any reprogramming authority yeah. going yeah. forward? Right. Yeah. Well, the discussion I think uh, you and I have also been party to, to this discussion is that by unilaterally reprogramming, it was going to affect our ability long term to be able to do discretionary reprogramming that we had traditionally done in coordination. It was a very difficult discussion. And we understand the significant downsides of losing what amounts to a privilege. The uh, conversation took place prior to the declaration of a national emergency. It was part of the consulting that went on. We said, here are the risks, longer term to the department. And those risks, risks were weighed. And then given a legal order from the commander in chief, we are executing on that order. And as, as we discussed, the first reprogramming was a billion dollars. And I wanted to do it before we had this commi committee hearing because we've been talking about this for some time. And I've been deliberately working to be transparent in this process fully knowing that there is downsides, which will hamper us. And I mean, ultimately, you asked for yes for a billion dollars yesterday. It is still the plan to ask for $2.4 billion um, out of the drug enforcement account? Uh, we, ha we haven't made the assessment of what, so consider these increments or tranches, however you want to phrase them. Uh, potentially, we could draw $2.5 billion when we look at the 
the total general uh, transfer authority. We think beyond that would be too painful to being able to continue and maintain readiness and operations. Okay. But we don't know what that next increment of, of funding would look like. All right. and, and one final question on this piece. You're getting the money because I believe it's the Army, or was it the Army and the Marine Corps yeah. that did not meet their in-strength goals? Yeah let, me, or, let me, yeah, let me ask David Norquist. Okay, sure. Yeah. So the, the source of the money, as you pointed out at the beginning, is the military personnel account. The Army was falling short of its recruiting targets by about 9,000, 9,500. And so funds that would have gone to pay right. those soldiers had they been on board is no longer needed for that purpose. That military personnel account is more like a mandatory in the sense that if there's no purpose, there's not a lot of, of other uses. And so it's available for reprogramming under those circumstances. Understood. And so for the mm -hmm. FY20 budget, mm -hmm. um, does your personnel request reflect that inability to recruit? Do you sort of factor in, okay, we'd like to have this many, but we're not? Um, does it make sense to give you the same amount of money for MILPERS if it's just going to wind up in the drug enforcement account and then go to building a wall? Can I make a I believe we did that. Yeah. Yes, so we went ahead and planned the 20 budget off of the, uh, the Army revised its expectations for next year accordingly, and that's the number that's in the 20 budget, sir. Okay. Final question. So when it comes to the budget, overall budget number, um, and I do have a slight quibble with the, with the idea that somehow this is all a problem because the Obama administration cut defense, I think to the extent that we rely on that political talking point, it undercuts the fact that this all happened because of the battle over the budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Budget Control Act wasn't passed because the Obama administration decided they wanted to do it. It was passed because we were literally two days away from not paying our debts. There was a refusal by the then Republican controlled Congress to raise the debt ceiling. And the only deal to be able to raise the debt ceiling was to agree to sequestration in the Budget Control Act. Um, it was a bipartisan um, act of, uh, well, self-flagellation, if you will, in terms of messing up our budget for 10 years to come just because we didn't have the political courage to live with the consequences of the money we had already spent. Um, and that led to no end to problems, but it was a bipartisan problem. And really, it's a bipartisan unwillingness to address the reality that you can't balance the budget while cutting taxes and increasing spending. A choice has to be made. But we decided not to make that choice. We decided to punt it into the artificial uh, Budget Control Act Sequestration Act. So a little greater honesty about the budget choices we face is the best way out of this, not you know any fault of the Trump administration or the Obama administration. But the question I have, General Dunford, take a stab at this. The, the President at one point, I don't know, several months ago, said that he felt a $700 billion defense budget made sense. Several days after that, um, you know, they had settled on, well, before that, there was the $733 billion number, which people had talked about as, I think, what was reflected in the, in, you know, plus inflation, the 5% number that a bipartisan group had come up with. Um, so, you know, it had been 733. The president said, you know, I think we can do 700. Then there was back and forth. A bunch of people talked to him. And then it became 750. Okay. Um, and... You know, one of the things on the credibility here is we always hear from you guys, we absolutely have to have this money. I think the way one uh, general testifying said, anything below 733 creates an unacceptable amount of risk. Um, I kind of find that hard to believe. And is, is now the statement anything below 750 becomes an unacceptable, unacceptable amount of risk? Where is the rigor in terms of what that number is to make sure that it is truly funding what our national security needs are if that number can move $50 billion in the space of a few tweets? Chairman, I, I, can, I can address uh, the specific uh, part of the budget that, it, that uh, talks to joint war fighting capabilities. And that represents, uh, as Ranking Member Thornberry pointed out, about a 2.9 percent real growth increase over last year. And in terms of analysis, uh, back, going back to 2015, we did an, a detailed analysis at the top secret level of all of what we call competitive areas, space, cyberspace, electronic warfare, maritime capability, land, and so forth. So we looked at ourselves, and then we looked at what we had in the plan going out to 2025. And then we worked with the intelligence community, and we did a similar study of China and Russia, the benchmark, if you will, for our path of capability development. And we looked at the trajectory of capability development that Russia and China were on. 
and we looked at what should our force look like in 2025 to make sure that we had a competitive advantage. Again, that competitive advantage defined as the ability to and reject just so power. As a result of that process, you came up with the $733 billion number, correct? That number is completely informed by the analysis we did for the path of capability development. Yes, Chairman. Okay. It's just worth noting that the pre President's request was for, was for 750, <laughs> despite all of that analysis that said 733. Um, so, that's the type of rigorous analysis I think I think we need to get to a number, not just deciding we want to spend more money uh, for the sake of spending more money. So I, I appreciate that. I want to get to some other people here, so I'm going to yield to Mr. Thornberry. Let me just mention that I completely agree with the chairman. Both parties are responsible for the irresponsible approach we took for to uh, funding defense. And I also agree with the chairman that uh, changing decades of, 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 of uh, reprogramming uh, practice is going to have uh, difficult consequences for the whole government, but especially for the Department of Defense. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, you heard me reference uh, testimony that we in the Senate have uh, repeatedly received from Secretary Mattis and also from General Dumford about the need for at least three to five percent real growth through 2023 uh, and that that figure was endorsed by the bipartisan national strategy commission i don't recall that you have ever weighed in on what sort of top line growth and there's lots of discussion underneath the top line i'm just talking about a top number uh, what sort of top line level is necessary for us to continue to repair readiness and also uh, deal with the complex threats posed by Russia, China, and others? Thank you, sir. The, uh, you know, quite often people will not kind of pick a number, they'll look over time and say, you know, an aggregate, you know, what, what should a number be or what should a, a trend be? But going back to Chairman Dunford's comments on the rigor and analytics behind the way we've put together the national defense strategy. There are three trends that are very important that factor into the rate of growth. And this is a, a real growth rate, so adjusted for inflation. First, the world continues to get more dangerous. And so that really manifests itself in troop strength. The second component is we're re still recovering readiness. Those are, you know, real accounts that we have to restore and sustain. And probably the biggest driver for our growth is modernization. With great power competition and a focus on Russia and China, we haven't modernized in three decades. And the investment required to do that in parallel with those three other activities drive three to 5% real growth if we want to do it in a timely manner. This is all about how much risk and how much time we want to, um, you know, assume. I don't think we have enough time to address these these issues. That's why you need the the greater uh, growth. And 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 so I guess the flip side is, without three to five percent real growth, we are taking increased risk. We cannot accomplish the three things that that you talked about. Yeah, I think you know it's it's. Uh, Sometimes risk gets too broadly characterized. I look at the risk really into kind of two elements. You can take operational risk or risk on modernization. And so the difference between the $700 billion number and the $733 billion was deciding where you want to take risk. So do we want to invest in modernization or do, and, and have a smaller force, or do we want to have a larger force to deal with the threats of the world and forego some of the great power competition. I believe we have to do both. Okay. And when I think of the risks, those are the two we have to manage. General Dunford, I'm not sure that you and the chairman were uh, uh, exactly communicating. Uh, when you talked about the analysis that y'all performed, uh, did that result in a uh, defense request, actually it's national security request, of uh, 733 billion dollars if so where did the three to five percent real growth come from because 733 billion dollars is not three percent real growth 
Uh, thank you, Rank uh, Thornberry, for allowing me to clarify. What I was speaking about is inside the budget, the piece that I provided recommendations on were the military capabilities inside the budget, those things that will directly contribute to joint war fighting. And in that area, I'm confident of the analysis that we did, and I'm confident that the budget reflects a 2.9 percent real growth in joint war fighting capabilities. Okay. So uh, do you have any amendments or change to the testimony that you have given us before that uh, 3% real growth is necessary to stay even, 5% real growth is necessary to catch up on, on China, Russia, and readiness problems. I don't have any, any change to that at all. Uh, that's exactly what our analysis highlights. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of you for joining us today, and particularly to General Dunford. It's been a privilege and, and really an honor to work with you over the years. Uh, I had a, a visit to the border um, and to our troops really a few days ago. And in light of that, I wanted to just address some of the, the issues that the, um, the chairman just mentioned, because I think there has been some confusion as you're, and as you're talking about the need to really, you know, focus more on national security needs, of course, and readiness, you know, that raises the question of why we're not trying to really answer the issue uh, that's in front of us when it comes to the personnel at the border. Um, because the situation that we're in right now is just not sustainable. Uh, I think we, we all acknowledge that. Um, so having been on the border, we're about 3,000 short in terms of personnel there. And that makes this situation difficult, as you can, as you can well imagine, and part of what we're trying to deal with. Can you speak um, a little more specifically to um, what, what's happening, uh, what just happened in terms of the transfer uh, of money? And um, when is that gonna be done? Is that done? Is it still, still in process? David, you wanna give the status of the reprogramming? So the, the reprogramming went to the, the committee yesterday. And that's the notification of the intent to move the money from, from one account to another. It wouldn't be used until it was obligated onto a contract. Those, of course, take some amount of time. We want to make sure the committee has awareness, so we're not trying to, to rush things. We just want to do it in deliberation. But uh, that will move at the point when it is necessary to award it on the contract. We just wanted to make sure the committee had the notification that we are moving it from one to the other, Could and that will, of course, uh, Could you speak to the nature of those contracts um, as well? Oh, those are uh, construction contracts for border barriers. Okay. And uh, as you said, you haven't started that process yet? In terms of... The, do you want to talk to the overall process or do you want me to? Okay. So just to, to go back through the overall process for 284. With the, with the authority of the 284, we received a request for assistance... <clears throat> from the Department of Homeland Security. It was received by the Secretary. He then tasked out to the Department to do our analysis, joint staff, general counsel, comptroller, and others, and to come back with identifying which of those construction projects are appropriate. One of the requirements is uh, interdicting drug quarters. That analysis has been done. He's identified a set of projects <clears throat> to use those fundings for, and one of the steps before we can move the money is to send a notification to the committee. The date when the money literally changes colors inside the financial system uh, depends, but it needs to be moved prior to any contract being awarded. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you said that the money is coming from the unallocated uh, end strength for the Army? It's coming out of the military personnel account. It was provided for uh, end strength recruitment that didn't happen, and that's why it's available. And does that, is that something that goes goes forward are are you not worried that that's going to make it make a difference down the line well the uh that money is only available till 30 september so it doesn't it's not one of those accounts that would carry over from one year to the next so the amount of funding the army needs in fy20 is a number that it is requested in the fy20 budget and this committee would need to access separately but you, you spoke of making adjustments though down the line since you see that that's you're not able to meet those um, those those targets. Oh, the Army made adjustments, as the chairman asked earlier, in its 20 budget, reflecting the fact that it was not meeting its original 19 targets. So we're not asking for more money in 20. 
that we would not be able to use again. We made sure we accounted for those concerns. Okay, but we also know that basically um, Congress had denied President Trump's request for the dollars to build the border wall, and here we are. Yeah, and I know you, you said it was a difficult decision mm -hmm. um, because it sets precedent. Mm -hmm. Did you want to build this? Do you want me to keep going? Okay. Uh, how so are we yeah. Go, so how are we going to address these issues? So when we receive the, in this case, the request from DHS, we go through the evaluation process. We understand that there's other issues going on with the Congress, uh, but this is the direction we received uh, from the administration regarding the, the RFA, and this is how we evaluated and responded to that request for assistance. Thank you. I mean, I, I have to say, I mean, I'm very concerned that we're not able to meet our needs on the border in terms of our Border Patrol agents. Um, but there are reasons for that. And we can deal with them in our budget, and we can deal with them in the way that we respond to this so, issue. No and so expired. I'm Thank afraid you. we're not going to get to the real, the real end. Mr. Thank Turner. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, we're asking the Department of Defense to do three major things that we don't usually ask them to do all at once. And the first is, is rebuild the military as a result of our readiness crisis. Uh, the second, uh, is to complete the modernization that's currently on our books. And the third is to look to the future, uh, to already say that our near-peer adversaries are beginning to, to threaten our superiority and to plan for modernization. Now, we've, we've given you in um, fiscal year 18 and 19 the beginnings of rebuilding the military. We're planning, of course, for 3 to 5 percent uh, real growth. But we have a number of things to do. I want to associate my uh, comments with the chairman on a number of areas in which we have bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have bipartisan support for the fact that our military budget should not be cannibalized for our border security needs. However, we have bipartisan disagreement on how to accomplish that because I believe that Congress needs to fund closing the border, and certainly the House voted last year to, to do so. Um, I agree with the chairman with respect to we have bipartisan support that OCO should not be used, and I appreciate his comments that we, hopefully we will have a bipartisan budget agreement for two years to, to, to cease that because I know it has effects on, on your operations. And, and then thirdly, his statement that um, bipartisan support for an audit um, and um, making certain that the Department of Defense can, um, can effectively tell us how the funds are being used. Mm -hmm. But all those things, managing them, where there's bipartisan support of, of constraints on you, still translate to we need you to, to be able to effectuate modernization, rebuilding, um, and at the same time uh, ending our, um, our, our crisis on um, our operations. So I'm ranking member on the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. I'm going to ask you both uh, General Dunford and yourself issues concerning nukes. Um, we have had on the books nuclear modernization that's needed, not just because our adversaries are beginning mm -hmm. to bypass us in their own modernization, but because of the aging inventory, our aging capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Secretary, even if Russia and China were not modernizing, could you please articulate why we have a need to modernize uh, our nuclear weapons stockpile and the, its current threat for our nuclear stockpile to remain an active deterrent, Mr. Secretary? Sure. The, the first most fundamental issue is obsolescence. You know, when we look at the uh, Minuteman III program at the end of the dec decade, it simply times out. The, the bomber program, uh, capacity and capability to deliver nuclear weapons. So. You know, first and foremost, this is really about a nuclear enterprise that's run its course in time. There's another very critical element to this, and that's the nuclear, the NC3 capability, command, control, and, and communication, which is even, you know, more complicated than just replacing the, the ballistic missiles. Chairman? General Alford, I could add, as you're beginning to answer, could you please also add to your answer the issue of the triad and the issue that we have of the vulnerability as an effective deterrent? Because you know, currently, obviously, our, our subs have um, uh, you know, some ability to, uh, to avoid detection. Tomorrow, that could not be the case, and we would be in a, a very tough situation if we did not have the triad. Uh, General, could you explain that to us? Congressman, thanks. First, uh, just to reinforce what the Secretary said, we, we use three adjectives to describe the nuclear enterprise safe, reliable, and effective. And so your question was, even if Russia and China weren't modernizing, which they are, uh, we would still have to modernize to make sure that we had a safe, reliable, and effective nuclear deterrent. In a particular area of concern, again, uh, notwithstanding what the Chinese and Russians are doing right now, is the aging nuclear command, control, and communication system. So we absolutely would have had to get after that. 
Your question to try it is somewhat related. We have done two nuclear posture reviews uh, since I've been the chairman. One during the President Obama's administration, one during President Trump's administration. In both cases, uh, we looked, people went into that with an open mind to see uh, do we need to continue to maintain a triad to have an effective deterrent? And it was concluded that we needed to do that. Uh, each leg of the triad has a unique capability, and it also complicates the adversary's ability to have a technological breakthrough that would undermine the credibility uh, and the, and the uh, ability of our, of our nuclear triad. So uh, that's a big piece of it. You talked about the submarine specifically, so I'll address that. That gives us the most secure, the most safe legged to try it, a reliable second strike. Uh, if you look at the bomber, it's, a, it's an option that can be recalled. And if you look at the ground-based uh, element of the nuclear deterrent, it's, it's an element that complicates the adversary's targeting. So again, each one of those has an operational role, but it also in the aggregate prevents a technological breakthrough that would undermine the credibility of our deterrent. Thank you, General. Mr. Secretary, do we want Turkey in the F-35 program? Your microphone. We absolutely do. We need Turkey to buy the Patriot. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Langerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome before the committee in your current capacity. And, uh, gentlemen, thank you all for your service and the work you're doing. Uh, is, is, Mike, is the mic on? Okay. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Secretary, I'm going to start with you, if I could. Um, the, uh, the national defense strategy focuses on great uh, power competition and places less emphasis on uh, countering violent extremist organizations. Uh, US, uh, uh, Social, uh, US OCOM uh, has been primarily focused on uh, counter-violent uh, extremist organization missions since 9-11, and, uh, and geographic combatant commanders uh, continue to have an insatiable appetite for, for SOF and CT. Uh, security cooperation and other missions. So I've been uh, concerned about the demands placed on your SOF and the belief that, uh, that we need to rethink our reliance on this force uh, for every mission to ensure that uh, it, it doesn't break from over, uh, over reliance. So, Mr. Secretary, has the Department considered a major force restructure review of uh, U.S. Social uh, uh to underscore and uh, ready to determine what it needs to look like to fulfill uh, Title X uh, core mission sets, maintain uh, sustainable uh, counterterrorism campaign, and, uh, and to also to ensure readiness for, the, for, the, for future conflict. Uh, thank you, Congressman. The focus of the Department has not been in separate Title X capability, but in capacity. Do we have sufficient capacity? As you described, there is constant tension to address a variety of global missions given the violent extremist organizations that continue to propagate around the world. The chairman's role as the global integrator is to determine what is the risk balance that we need to maintain and what is the appropriate capacity. So our budget is really focused on do we have the right capacity, not necessarily the right structure, which is what I was, I think you were alluding to. And I just asked the chairman maybe to comment on how he prepares his global campaign plans and is sizing the counterterrorism effort. Congressman, and I'm primarily I think, concerned about getting. Yeah, I think we we share on. your perspective about both the overuse of special operations capability and the need for special operations capability to be relevant across the range of military operations. And so, with that in mind, two years ago, uh, it really is a, a force management issue. We adjusted the employment of special operations to be at a more sustainable rate. That does two things. Uh, one is uh, it addresses the human factors associated with overemployment, but the other is it allowed them then sufficient time to train for some of the high-end tasks associated with operations uh, in, the, in the context of great power competition. And how is the department looking across the, the conventional forces to determine what missions and requirements could be filled by forces such as the Army Security Force uh, Assistance Brigade uh, versus SOF? Yeah, no, Congressman, a great question, and, and that, that's part of our, what we call a global force management allocation process. So 
we look at all the requirements that are identified by the combatant commander and we try to come up with the right sourcing solution for the, for the combatant commander's tasks. But, but completely informing specific allocation decisions is the need for us to get to a sustainable level of, of operational employment. And, uh, and again, uh, over the last two years, we have, we have pulled back the throttle, so to speak, to make sure that our forces are being employed at a more sustainable deployment to dwell rate. I, I continue to be, remain uh, concerned about uh, over-reliance on SOF, and, and we want to make sure we get that balance right. Let me uh, turn to another topic, uh, Mr. Secretary, climate change. Uh, the FY18 uh, NDAA contained a provision that I authored that was supported by uh, bipartisan majorities in this committee and in the full House that instructed each service to assess the top 10 military installations likely to be affected by climate change over the next 20 years. Unfortunately, the report that was delivered in January ignored uh, the clear instruction provided by law, uh, it failed to provide a ranking of installations, uh, and uh, in not just looking at CONUS, but uh, worldwide, and, uh, and lacked the methodological rigor really required to adequately evaluate risk. In response to the concerns I raised, uh, the, the Department came back yesterday with what I consider to be a uh, half-baked uh, baked, uh, rejoiner using the same uh, methodology uh, and a list uh, of CONUS installations as the initial report. Uh, Secretary Shanahan, uh, I, I repeatedly made myself available to clarify the intent behind the language and the statute known from the Department has taken me up on the offer. Do you agree that, that climate change poses a threat to our readiness, to our ability uh, to, uh, to achieve military objectives? And I'm sorry, this is going to have to be a really quick answer because we're about out of time, but go ahead. Microphone. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I believe we need to address resilience in our operations and our design and how we build out our facilities. Okay. Thank you. And, and I did, should have said this at the beginning for the purpose of the witnesses. We try to keep it within five minutes, questions and answers. So try not to cut you off in mid-sentence if we can avoid it, but we want to make sure we get to as many people as possible. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of y'all for being here and for your service to our country. Secretary Shanahan, I appreciate you uh, taking the lead in uh, the effort you put into the development of a Space Force uh, in the Department of uh, Defense. Uh, this, the administration's Space Force proposal is very, the one that you sent over is very uh, comprehensive. How would you prioritize uh, the reform efforts within the DOD, uh, given the choice between a Space Force, U.S. Space Command, or Space Development Agency, which one do you think is most important to be pushed through today? I would push forth standing up of the U.S. Space Command because it's the easiest and most impactful, followed then by the Space Development Agency. Excellent. Uh, we've heard it argued that creating a, a, a space-centric force is anti-joint that it uh, flies in the face of the effort to make things more joint the, uh, within the department over the last 30 years. I would argue that the fragmented leadership in space has uh, equally existed for the uh, fa past 30 years. So my question is, how do you reconcile these two trains of thought? Uh, does creating a space force go against the basic principles of jointness, or how do you believe that such a, a uh, move can contribute to a more joint, effective, lethal war fighting uh, future con in future conflicts? Yeah, no, I, I think it is enormously powerful to be able to create jointness. Um, two areas, and, the, and the, the chairman brought this up, but it's particularly around uh, procurement and delivering capability. We have 10 different architectures going on in the department in a variety of capabilities. Command and control is, 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 is one of them. This is an opportunity to have commonality across the whole of the department, something we've never been able to achieve. The space for is that uniting construct. And then we also have a, a chance with this singular focus to drive much great, greater integration into the combatant commands. Great. Uh, and can you elaborate on why you chose to put the Space Force in the Department of the Air Force as opposed to a uh, SOCOM type structure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the. Uh, the Air Force is where the skill is for space. So, I mean, most, most fundamentally, as we reshape and, and reconstruct, you want to be where the, where the people are that have the background. This is really more about a structural change. The, uh, the SOCOM model, uh, very different. The, the types of 
of equipment and capabilities they develop are, you know, less, I'll say, much less complex than what we put on orbit. Air Force inherently has the skill set to manage and lead the Space Force. Great. Thank you. General Dunford, there's been a lot of debate within the, over the, uh, the value of the air, land, and sea legs of our nuclear triad. Uh, what is your best military advice as to how to balance these priorities? Uh, Congressman, just for clarification, balance the priorities across the triad or across the department's portfolio as a whole? Across the triad. Across the triad. Uh, Congressman, we've done, as, as, uh, as you know, two nuclear posture reviews uh, in the past eight years. Uh, in fact, two since, since I've been the chairman. And uh, both of those have indicated the need to modernize the triad. So we have a, in the program right now a plan to modernize all three legs of the triad. Uh, and to do that in a way that allows us, and that'll represent at the peak, 7% uh, of the department's budget, which means 93% of the department's budget will be spent on other things other than the most important element uh, of our department's mission, which is nuclear deterrence. Great. And uh, can you tell the committee, in your best military advice, uh, would you advise the adoption of a no first use policy? Uh, I would not uh, uh, recommend that. I think anything that uh, simplifies an enemy's decision-making calculus would be a mistake. I'm very comfortable with the policy that we have right now. It creates a degree of ambiguity, and I thought the way that it was articulated in our nuclear posture review is exactly right for the security environment that we find ourselves in right now. Excellent. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Dumford, you mentioned, uh, I think perhaps in response to Chairman Smith's comments, that a series of assessments you developed, in your words, as baselines to determine the state of what the competitive advantage is of the joint force. Um, I was curious, though, uh, how, we can how we can articulate what a competitive advantage is by way of the joint military net assessment process if we haven't determined what competition is. Um, by way of investments and resourcing. And we have an idea of who we're competing against, um, but we don't seem to be uh, necessarily choosing between all the tools that we can use versus the ones that won't be as successful in, in, in this competition. Can you talk a little bit more about the science versus the art of this competitive advantage and these choices you make in investment and resourcing? Oh, I absolutely can, uh, Congressman. First, uh, in terms of the what we are trying to do, we went into this to say that Russia and China uh, are the benchmark against which we measure our capabilities. And against Russia and China, we want to be able to do two fundamental things. One, we want to move forces into the theater to meet our alliance commitments and advance our national interests, whether it's in Eurasia or it's in, in the Pacific. And, uh, and then we say we want to be able to operate uh, freely across all domains, sea, air, land, space, and, cyber, and cyberspace. And so I think we actually have a fair degree of, of uh, analytic rigor in looking at uh, the challenges currently posed by China and Russia uh, to our ability to project power and then achieve superiority in any of those domains at the time and place of our choosing to accomplish our mission. And so this is very much based, benchmarked against campaign outcomes against those two pair competitors across all domains in the context of meeting our alliance commitments and advancing our, our national security. So I, I'd be happy to come up and, uh, and spend more time uh, talking to you about it. But, but actually, I think we have a very clear target that we're shooting on. I think we have a very clear assessment of where we are today relative to where we need to be. And although we'll refine the path uh, along which we will uh, maintain our competitive advantage in the future, I think we've got a pretty clear sight picture of where we think we need to go over the next five to seven years. Again, it'll be refined by wargaming and exercises and so forth, but, but I think we have a pretty clear vision now of the cardinal direction that we need to go on to be able to do the kinds of things we anticipate needing to do. I think I'd like to take you up on that offer. Sure. Uh, to come up uh, and, and brief a little more on that. Uh, if I, I want to poke at this a little bit as well, though, uh, because uh, we get testimony from the department on the advancements in supercomputing and AI, and so we've set up the Jake and, and moving forward. The RD, RDT and E budget, I understand, is nine billion more than last year. Is that right? But most of that increase is actually not in the base budget. It's in the base OCO budget. Is that true as well? 
Mr. Norquist, do you know that? No, I, I don't. I don't believe that's that it's predominantly in the OCO budget. The things that generally moved are like weapons systems sustainment. I think the R and D. Well, it's a spread account. Well, I, I think you're going to have to take a look at the, the increase. I think if, uh, we'll go back and take a look at that. That it's in the base OCO as opposed to the base. So I'm wondering if if these things are priorities, how you make a choice between putting them in the actual base budget versus this fake base that's in the OCO. I would not assign any higher or lower priority to something versus in the base versus the OCO for base. We did it in a way. Well, I would because I've been here since the early 2000s, and it's, it's this is exactly the problem with OCO. It started off as the global war on terrorism, and we could actually define some things that were specific to GWAT, and now we're in the, what's happening now is exactly what we thought would happen, using the OCO budget for something that isn't. It's not supposed to be used for. Things are supposed to be in the base. So I, I guess I would disagree with you, although we sit in different spots and make, making this, these decisions. Mm -hmm. And now we're having, now we're stuck with a budget that's not really, it's not really based on a base. It's based on shoving things in an OCO budget because it's available, not because they're supposed to be doing it. So we, we built it according, as was mentioned earlier, to the direction we were given. What we did to try and make it easier for the, the staff that we work with is to separate in the way the budget submitted those things that are would think of as traditional OCO, direct war cost, enduring cost, and those are in the budgets listed separately from the OCO. To that the is the OCO budget. That's what it's for. Understood. It doesn't seem like it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, Mr. Conaway. Mm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Gentlemen, thank you uh, for your continued emphasis on auditing the books and records at the Department of Defense. Uh, it's a stunningly difficult task, and I know that the men and women who are actually trying to do that day in and day out must feel like Sisyphus uh, each day, but uh, it really is uh, important. Uh, good progress being made this past year. Please express to all of them uh, my thanks officially. Uh, I know I've spoken to several of you about it uh, to continue to do that, but this is really important work for the men and women in uniform and, and, uh, and the civilians who are trying to get this work done. Uh, thank you for continuing to budget the requisite resources necessary in a, in an op in a, in a period where uh, uh, budgeting is really difficult. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Norquist, thank you for your attention to the notices of findings and recommendations, actually assigning specific um, uh, t uh, people to those tasks and then holding them accountable for getting that done. That will pay dividends. Uh, moving forward, so uh, uh, no real comment from you necessary other than uh, thank you for keeping up the good work and, and we'll finally get that done. The uh, Army S strength <clears throat> was dropped to 480,000, was uh, down from 487.5. Is that a reflection of the needs of the Army or was that a reflection of the Army's inability to uh, recruit to that higher number? And if that's the case, can you talk to us about the drivers for why the Army can't meet its end strength uh, from, uh, from physical 19? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the, uh, to, the, to the total number, the recruiting challenge, and what the Army is doing to address that. So it really is a shortfall in recruiting. The uh, Army has now gone forth, and what David described earlier was we did reset the top line to adjust for lowering the total end strength because we failed to recruit what we had projected. The Army has doubled down on changing how they've, where they're recruiting, how they're recruiting, so that they can start to recover growth in the, in the end strength. It's several thousand um, in this budget. Chairman, I don't know if you have any comments on uh, the specific uh, recruiting and retention, but what we've seen is... is there, are there drivers in the population they're trying to recruit from? Is I, it the economy? I think, what, what's what's yeah. causing the shortfall? Yeah, the, the, the fundamental shortfall is a very competitive economy. I mean, we're all in this uh, worldwide competition for talent, so, you know, fundamentally it's a, it's a very competitive market. It's the, it's the good side of a, a strong economy. Congressman, I, I would add just one point. Uh, only about 29 percent of the demographic from which we draw are physically, mentally, and psychologically capable of service. To put that, put, put a finer point on it, just slightly over a quarter of the population from which we typically recruit are actually eligible mm -hmm. for military service. That combined with uh, the current environment we find ourselves now, uh, a pretty competitive economic environment, it's always tough 
uh, recruiting, it's particularly tough right now. And I think the Army's challenges are kind of a bellwether uh, for the future without some adjustments. And I know all the service chiefs are looking very carefully at, at uh, recruiting and retaining high quality people as being a core, a core mission for us. Of, so, of, of the 7,700 uh, increase in end strength in this year's budget, 2,000 of those are Army? Well, uh, from what they wound up, yeah, I understand, but it's down from where the fiscal 19 number was. Right. Uh, well, General Dufford, I know that it's not your job or the, the Department of Defense's job to look at why uh, we've got so few men and women who are physically and mentally capable of uh, doing that, but I think our society does need to, to address that issue. And, and then uh, appropriate attention being given to the impact the Army has on being short from what they would normally be if they just stick with the, uh, you know, the 487 five that was authorized in 19, uh, impact on the Army's ability to do what they need to do. I assume they're, somebody's looking at that. The conversation about OCO, um, the budget cap is law, and that's what you're required to, uh, to go to. Uh, is that distracting to have that uh, artificial, uh, unrealistic number in law that has no basis in any kind of uh, buildup of what we ought to be uh, hang over your head? Is that the real driver for uh, trying to adjust the OCO number to, to fit what the, what the military needs of $750 billion? It, it hampers the way we budget. So if you look at how we budgeted last year and how we built the budget up this year, the underlying process is exactly the same. The strategy is exactly the same. How we put it together is exactly the same. How we presented it to you is different. Right. Thank you for sharing your back. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each of the distinguished witnesses here today. Uh, Acting Secretary of Defense Shanahan, I'd like to focus on you and on the space capabilities that we're anticipating having, whether you call that a force or a core. Uh, first of all, I'm assuming that the President's budget proposal is not written in stone. We're a co-equal branch of government, and we, of course, have the right to change that, right? You do. So if there are certain poison pills in that proposal, we have the right to remove those poison pills, right? I'm not aware of any poison pills. Well, <laughs> well things we might view as poison pills. Okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I know that you're very familiar with the committee's prior work on a space core mm -hmm. and the fact that this committee had, at one point, a 60 to 1 vote in favor of a core. Mm -hmm. So I heard your answer in response to my friend and Mr. Rogers that the most important part of your proposal is the space command. That that's what we need to kind of lead the charge toward enhancing our space capabilities. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, I answered the question of the three pieces, which is the, the most important. I, I assume we're going to do all of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to do all of it too, but um, we have to make sure we can navigate it through Congress. Right. Um, I'm not asking you to judge this. I'm going to give you my appraisal. It yeah. seems like that the proposal we received on our space capabilities mm -hmm. is actually much closer to what this committee passed two years ago mm -hmm. than it is to what had been mentioned in other press conferences. Mm -hmm. For example, when the Secretary of the Air Force gave a budget estimate of $13 billion to stand up a space capability, this proposal is $2 billion, mm -hmm. which is much closer to a, Mr. Rogers and my proposal, which was essentially to spend as little money as possible just to reorganize the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So that's my judgment, not yours. Mm -hmm. Another key judgment is this. We never called for a separate military department. Mm -hmm. We wanted it to be underneath the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, is what's in the latest proposal from the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. um, some people make the Marine Corps analogy. Mm -hmm. That's why we called it a Corps mm -hmm. as opposed to a force. It's easier for people to understand, mm -hmm. like the Marine Corps. Right. Um, another key element is that uh, we had already passed into law that the fact that the new Space Command would be a sub-unified command, mm -hmm. and now y'all are asking that it be upgraded to a full command. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be a problem, it would seem to me. Right. But in these various ways, mm -hmm. both the keeping it under the Air Force, mm -hmm. not spending it much money, mm -hmm. and in having a space command, we're, mm -hmm. we're pretty much in sync on these priorities, yeah. right? We are, very Good. much so. Well, 
I hope that we can work constructively together to smooth out any rough edges in the proposal and to keep things on track, not only to pass this House, but also to pass the Senate, because I certainly feel a lot of urgency in enhancing our space capabilities, and even in your five-year transition approach, that's five years that we may or may not have vis-a-vis -vis certain near-peer adversaries. Right. I, I fundamentally think we can go faster, I, and I appreciate your leadership, and uh, Representative Turner was a, uh, a catalyst to move more quickly. I think, to your earlier point, the, uh, the basic elements are in place. I think the chairman would say we have too much bureaucracy and too much cost. In the areas uh, where we should be taking cost out, I'm feeling aligned. The, the capabilities we have really allow for growth. And, and if, if we had more time to go into how we've put together the proposal, Technically, we're aligned with the intelligence community, so down the road, that integration can take place. We also are provisioned, if we wanted to set up a separate department, sometime long term. But the, the kernels to get this started are very sound, and I think we have a, a really good, strong proposal. I see my time is about to expire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us today, and I appreciate uh, your service. Acting Secretary Shanahan, I want to talk to you specifically about uh, aircraft carriers. As you know, the President's yeah. plan has us retiring uh, CVN-75, the USS Harry S. Truman, uh, without going through the complex refueling. The Navy says that they need 12 carriers. Mm -hmm. uh, Naval Warfare Doctrine says 12 carriers to generate two on station continuously mm -hmm. and three to surge. Mm -hmm. The question is, has there been some change in naval warfare doctrine that says that we're now going to nine, where we won't get back up above that until 2027? Is there a change in that doctrine? And can we generate carrier presence at 2.0 continuously in three in surge capacity uh, with only nine? Second question is, last Thursday you told Senator Imhoff that the retirement of the USS Truman was offset by the two-carrier block buy. We understand that the the early retirement saves $3.4 billion, mm -hmm. and while this might be true, you're losing 25 years mm -hmm. of tested and capable presence with that aircraft carrier by retiring it early, and we've invested a lot of money in that carrier. Right. You've also already spent $500 million in purchasing reactor cores mm -hmm. to refuel that carrier. Reactor cores don't work in right. other submarines. They only work in carriers, and they're designed specifically for the carrier at hand. So the question is, is does it make sense to retire this carrier early? And is the $3.4 billion in savings worth the 25 years of loss of presence that we will have by retiring this carrier early? I think the, so my answer to your, your question there is, I think it's the strategic choice we need to make. I believe, and, and this was a difficult choice. We spent a year making this decision and under no certain terms, aircraft carriers are vital now and vital into the future. The Truman decision was made in concert with the two-carrier buy. We looked at how to increase lethality. There isn't a drawdown of capacity until uh, mid-2020, so it's not like this is an irreversible decision, but we took the savings to invest in the future force. And all of this was very mindful of the industrial base. So the other consideration here was how do we invest in the supply chain and there's actually growth and employment. We can change these decisions, but I think as the Navy updates its 355 ship strategy and looks at its force structure, I think we may, we may get back to your original point around doctrine, let's see what, what they come back with. The question still is, does nine allow us to generate two continuously on station and three in surge? Yeah. Chairman, I'm going to ask you to answer that. Congressman, it, it would be difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. let, me, let me follow up on that, um, Chairman Dunford. You know, every combatant commander that I talk to indicates that uh, they're not sufficiently supported by the Navy based on their plans. And listen, I understand their plans always request a lot and that we're, we're able to give a finite amount. But 
I know that in carrier force structure, when it comes to being able to project power, that is, that is the framework and the strength of our ability to project forces uh, around the world and to project presence around the world. I wanted to know that um, in your professional judgment, what would the net operational impact for the Navy be of deactivating CVN-75 and a carrier air wing by FY 2024? Congressman, an important, an important assumption that if it doesn't have pain, we'll come back to that reversibility of the decision issue. An important assumption is that the money that was saved uh, by not refueling the Truman would be used to develop new ways of uh, conducting maritime strike. So when we look at the carrier, we're looking at it from a maritime strike capability. And, and a more diverse way of providing maritime strike is, is among the initiatives inside the department. So from a, a force management perspective and a joint warfighting perspective, if the path of capability development for a new way of delivering maritime strike in conjunction with the, with the carriers that we have in place today and will have in, the, in place in the future, uh, if that assumption doesn't obtain, then we'll have to go back to the secretary and have a conversation about reversibility of the decision yeah. because new programs combined with the programs of record today won't meet our aggregate maritime strike capability by the mid mid 20s and listen I'm, I'm all for those those unmanned systems but it is a big leap where we're only with sea hunter and it's in its initial trials to say we're going to completely replace a carrier that has that presence uh, without having a bridge to those expired. unmanned systems thank you mm. mr courtney Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And again, thank you to the witnesses and particularly uh, General Dunford. You've been a rock solid leader straddling two administrations and, and really just done an outstanding job. And again, thank you for your amazing service. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, based on your conversations regarding the reprogramming decision yesterday, uh, I would actually ask that the letter uh, date stamp March 25th from the acting secretary transferring a billion dollars out of the Army's account to the Department of Homeland Security be, uh, be entered for the record. Thank you. And um, I would just note that that, um, transmis that transmittal uh, actually pretty much almost exactly coincided with the submission um, to Congress of unfunded priorities from uh, the Pentagon in terms of the, um, uh, again, 2020 budget. Um, Mr. Um, Norquist, could you Tell us, what, what is the total amount of unfunded priorities that uh, came over from, from the Pentagon? I don't have the, the total yet from all of the services, sir. Okay, well, I can help you with that. It actually was 10.4 billion, and actually 2.3 billion came from the Army. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would just say you almost get whiplash around here trying to sort of follow the, the back and forth coming out of the department. I mean, exactly at the same time that a reprogramming decision was made, again, without consultation from Congress, which uh, again, as far as I'm concerned, is a Rubicon moment mm -hmm. in terms of just the comedy between the two branches that's operated for decades. Um, we're, we're also hearing from the Army that they actually, uh, by the way, need an additional $2.3 billion for the 2020 budget for unfunded priorities. And um, it, it just, again, really undermines the, the the confidence in terms of just the the, the messages that are that are coming over to us, uh, you know, from the Department of Defense, which again are really now in in a brave new world of basically treating um, the the defense committees as um, non-existent in terms of reprogramming decisions. Um, so um, again, just to follow up on, on Mr. Whitman's uh, questions for a moment, um, General Dunford, uh, Admiral Richardson and the, and the Navy are actually working on an updated force structure assessment for, for the shipbuilding plan. Isn't that correct? It is correct, Congressman. Do you know what, what's going to be in that FSA regarding carrier, the carrier fleet? Uh, I don't know what's going to be in the uh, in the FSA. And and as much as we are trying on sea power to find out the answer to those kinds of questions, we don't know either. And it just seems to me really premature for the department to to again come forward with a. Uh, decommissioning or mothballing of the Truman when we still don't even really know what the revised force structure assessment uh, looks like. Uh, as my friend from Virginia pointed out, th we've already got about 500 million in sunk costs for the, the reactors, which uh, according to the, the Navy are going to be, quote, put on a shelf, um, which again is a shelf that we really can't reach up for for the new Ford class program. That It's a different kind of reactor. So. Um, uh, the savings that you're projecting in the 2020 budget, it's $17 million for, for this year. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, it's $17 million. Okay, so 
We're, we're dealing with a decision which is premature in terms of being out of sequence with the, the Navy's updated force structure uh, assessment. We have $500 million in sunk costs that are already out the door, and we're going to save $17 million uh, with this request in, in the 2020 budget. Um, again, that really doesn't add up to a very good business case in terms of, um, you know, the very tough decisions that we're going to have to make. As the chairman points out, you know, the, the figure, the top line number that came, came over is um, decoupled from a, a deal on the, two, on the spending caps. Uh, I, I think it's a pretty safe bet that the top line for defense is going to come down when the two chambers actually do what should have been done over the last three months, which was to negotiate a, a, a sequestration uh, agreement with the administration. They, in, as far as I'm concerned, completely abdicated. Um, what everybody realizes must happen if we're going to move forward with the budget. And, um, and, and so we've got difficult budget choices um, to make ahead. And um, you know, being left with, with a business case that just, again, doesn't help us with getting to that point um, is just going to be a very tough sell, let's just say, uh, over at the Sea Power uh, Committee. I, I don't know how the clock is doing here, but... you got about 30 seconds left. Okay. So there's one clock over here that's working. They all shut okay. down. Uh, Mr. Here. Shanahan, uh, again, just real quick for the record, uh, your budget endorses planned procurement of three Virginia-class submarines in this year's budget. Is that correct? Yes that or no? That is correct. Yeah, thank you. I yield back. Um, thank you. We will endeavor to get the... Well, there we go. Um, the clocks are working again. Ms. Hartzler. Mm. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your service and uh, for your leadership for our national defense. Um, I appreciate the focus uh, on strategic competitors in the national defense strategy, and specifically China. I want to start off asking some questions about that, uh, because as we know, they've utilized economic, military, and political influence to extend their reach and shift the balance of power across the globe. And Beijing's whole of government efforts are particularly apparent in the areas like the Indo-Pacific, but they can be seen in places like South America, Europe, even the Arctic. So countering their influence and actions requires a whole of government strategy of our own. And so my first question is, who is leading the U.S. whole of government response effort and where does the Defense Department fit into this plan? So I'd say uh, fundamentally, Feel like the Department of Defense is leading significantly in the in the whole of government, but I have strong partnership with Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of Treasury, and Secretary of uh, State. So we continuously uh, discuss this subject, and we have activities that are coordinated between our departments. And I'd have to say, and not overlook the Department of Justice as we work on critical infrastructure. So are you saying then you are the, the main person in, in, in the lead? I, I wouldn't say that uh, by definition I've received some you know, nomination to that role, but by virtue of having more resources and capability than a lot of those other uh, departments, we've been an instigator, if you will, of collaboration and uh, working across as a whole of government. Do you get together regularly? with your counterparts and sit down and discuss this. Okay, State Department, why don't you do this? Treasury Department, let's do this. Weekly. 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 Good. Very good. Can you give some more detail about exactly uh, what the Defense Department's response is to China in this part of the plan? You want, yeah, we'll let the chairman start and then I want to pick up on especially uh, some of the economic, cyber, so the chairman. Yeah, Congresswoman, I just just talk about uh, posture, military posture, for example, and, and uh, I think, as you know, uh, we've got about two-thirds of the United States Air Force, two-thirds of the Navy, a significant part of the Army and the Marine Corps that are in the Pacific. We've also fielded our most modern capabilities in the Pacific, the P-8, the F-35, the LCS, and so forth. But the, but the real important piece, I think the important, most important military dimension of our strategy out there is developing stronger network of allies and partners. And I think our presence in the region, uh, the deterrence that we bring, uh, our ability and our, our, our physical manifestation of our ability to meet our alliance commitments are all a really important part of our uh, uh, achieving a proper balance with China and the Pacific. Very good. And as I've had opportunity to travel in the Pacific area and visit recently with ambassadors from Australia and uh, New Zealand, I, I would just 
continue to say how important it is that we be very strategic and purposeful in those relationships because China is being very purposeful and very aggressive and very assertive in developing those relationships. And uh, it's very key. Uh, I want to shift to the fighter force, uh, Secretary. And in your written testimony, you've discussed that $57 billion allocated to increase the procurement and the modernization of our fighter force. And you've noted that, that we need a balanced mix of fourth and fifth generation aircraft to effectively uh, uh, meet the entire spectrum of national defense strategy missions. Uh, and the Air Force needs to procure about 72 fighters each year. So what is the appropriate balance between fourth and fifth generation aircraft, and why do we need to address both in the requirements of the National Defense Strategy? Yes. Uh, thank you for that question. You know, my role is to make sure that we're developing responses in a force structure to the right campaigns. That's why our focus on Russia and China is so important. Each year we'll, we go through a new evaluation of what the tactical um, air mix should be, fourth gen, fifth generation. And of that mix, there are three parties that really provide an input. Probably the, the most significant input comes from the joint staff as they conduct a, a mission analysis for particularly China and Russia. And I'd ask the chairman to walk us through how they go about making that recommendation. Uh, Congressman, we did uh, today, just to talk about mix, so today we have 20 percent fifth generation, 80 percent fourth generation. That's what's in our inventory today. If you look at a 2040, it'll be 80 percent fifth generation, 20 percent fourth generation. And so along the way, we have to achieve the right balance based on capability. Uh, that's the ability to penetrate in the information capability represented by the F-35. I'm sorry, the gentlelady's time has expired, and I think we Got the gist there. Uh, I Mr. Mark Russ. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank our witnesses for coming today, particularly General Dumford, for your years of service. But I will follow up where my ranking member just left off between fourth and fifth generations. We've sat in these chairs for at least the last four years and almost exclusively heard fifth generation, fifth generation, fifth generation. The Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment. In a recent mandated study concluded the X15, or excuse me, the F15X will not be able to survive a more contested battle space, i.e., particularly China and Russia. So, we're trying to understand the requests that we're hearing for the new F15 versus what we've heard to this date, up to this date, that F35, the fifth generation. What has changed? General, in the last nine to 12 months to reverse what we've heard for the last four years? Uh, first, Congressman, with regard to the primary platform that the Department needs being the F-35, nothing has changed. Uh, we continue to do analysis uh, in wargaming and, and uh, in the most recent what we call competitive area studies. Mm -hmm. We took a look at what would be the optimal mix of uh, fourth and fifth generation aircraft. Fifth generation uniquely able to penetrate, uh, fourth generation providing some capacity. So we're balancing that capability capacity piece. It's more complicated than just the mix of aircraft with regard to the F-15. One of the issues is the F-15C is aging out. And so there was a cost variable uh, in, in, in place. It was also a partner with other nations piece in place with the decision to get the F-15. But it is all in the context of the migration from that 20 percent fifth generation today, 80 percent fifth generation tomorrow, in a path of development along the way that allows us to have a right mix of aircraft to accomplish the mission within the top line that we've been given. And I think the combina we, what we have seen in our competitive area studies is that the combination of the fifth generation capability with the capacity of the fourth generation was the right mix. That was agnostic of platforms, and that study was actually done before the Air Force made the specific F-15 decision, which added those additional variables when they, made the, when they decided on the F-15 uh, EX. So it's the, the, the generation of the fourth generation, the C model, which is deteriorating faster. That, that has happened in the last nine to 12 months the, that changed the, the decision from the last four years? That's right. When, the, when, when, a deci when we knew that the C was going to age out uh, earlier than we would have wanted it to age out, we had to come up with a replacement. And when we looked at all of those variables, capability of the platform, capacity of the force as a whole, 
cost uh, over time, as well as uh, impacts on the uh, industrial base as it pertains to us and our partners. That's how that decision was made. So but, I, but again, would highlight that there were probably four or five interdependent variables that led to that specific material solution. So you bring up capacity, and our understanding that the F-35 would have the capacity, as it has in this year, to increase its volume this year and future years to make up for what you talked about, the deficiency. Sure. Uh, capacity is, is twofold, Congressman. Thanks. Uh, one is uh, ability to carry uh, ordnance, and that's the one you alluded to. The other issue of capacity is the numbers of platforms that we have and we're able to field at any given time. And so it's really the latter uh, with regard to the F-15 that will be sustained, the capacity for aircraft will be sustained by the F-15 decision. How much of the operating costs of the F-35 factors into this? Because uh, plane for plane, they're roughly the equivalent, at least in this year's model. Yeah, I think if you could, if you could buy all F-35s, you might, you might do that. This, again, was looking out over time at the resources that would be available. And uh, the, uh, there's not much different in the procurement cost, but there's about a 50 percent difference in the operations and sustainment cost between the F-15 and the F-35. And the, uh, and the F-15 also has a pretty significant shelf life available as well. So, again, it was the combination of the platforms that we, uh, that we made a decision on. Are we expecting those uh, operational costs for the F-35 to decrease? That has been a singular focus of the secretary and the team over the last couple of years, working with Lockheed Martin. They absolutely have to decrease in order for us to have a balanced force in the future. And there, there has been some progress, but we, we believe more progress needs to be made in reducing the operation and sustainment costs of the F-35. There's no question about it. Well, we're going to have more discussion on these and certainly the impact of Turkey and the missiles that they're looking to purchase is going to all factor into this. Thank you for your testimony. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, gentlemen, getting back to, uh, I think it was Stephen Covey said that keeping the main thing the main thing. Um, in just under six months past, Hurricane Michael hit the coast. Uh, obviously, you've got a tremendous amount of damage from that storm, as does my congressional district. Congress is yet to be able to pass a disaster bill uh, for, for that region. And in just over six months, Secretary Shanahan, you will be responsible for executing a Department of Defense at the sequester caps if there is not some type of agreement made. By my calculation, that is somewhere around 60 legislative days bet between now and then. So my question is, if you had to execute a budget at the sequester caps, what would the impact of that be? Well, just then, <clears throat> it'd, be, it'd be very difficult to modernize because we're not going to walk away from our operations. So, you know, essentially the, the impact is to modernization. I mean, in the in the in the most simple, generalized terms. I mean, if you had to, if you had to trade for one thing, we're not going to, you know, drop our commitment to, to operations. So we forego our future. I mean, that's that's the big risk. General Dunford, from an operational standpoint, what what is the difference in us adopting an appropriation measure for you, say, September 1st instead of October 1st? Uh, to make sure I understand the question, Congressman, you're saying if we did not go into the fiscal year with a budget? I'm, my, oh, I yes, see what sir. you're saying, if we, if we have if, an agreement If we late. can give you your budget 30 days prior to the beginning of the fiscal sure. year so that you know what you have to execute with, what, what, what would happen with the efficiency of the operations at this point? You know, Congressman, I'm glad you asked the question. So going back to my days as the Assistant Commandant, I've been in and out of this now for, for more than a decade uh, dealing with this issue. And I would tell you that for us collectively, uh, one of the most inefficient things we do is have late budgets. It, it, it doesn't allow for the proper planning and being good stewards of the government's resources. So uh, in order for us to really deliver capability and at the end of the day campaign outcome uh, within the top line we've been given, it requires us to prioritize and allocate resources very deliberately. And, and budget instability and unpredictability uh, don't allow us to do that optimally, and it, and it wastes the government, it wastes taxpayer dollars. I'm, I'm concerned about what it does to morale as well for the, the families and, uh, and men and women that are actually in combat. It, it gives the impression that we in Congress do not care. So I, I would just hope that over the next 
a couple of weeks that we were able to come to some type of a CAPS agreement uh, between the House, the Senate, and the Presidency. Obviously, it requires a bipartisan agreement so that we're able to build a National Defense Authorization Act to whatever the agreement is and get the appropriation measures done uh, sooner rather than later. I have, have one uh, specific question uh, for Secretary Shanahan. Army, Army end strength, the, the request is $7,500 lower than the fiscal year 2019 authorization, uh, but the funding request is increased by almost $1.3 billion. Can you explain this difference? The, I, I believe the fundamental difference is the 3.1% pay raise. Did the, did the department request that, the pay raise at that level? The yes, 3 we did. Percent? yes, we did. We did request that at that level. Okay. Um, gentlemen, thank you for your, uh, for your service. I hope that over the next couple of weeks we're able to get to some type of agreement yeah. so that we're able to get uh, an appropriation measures passed for you uh, prior to the beginning of the fiscal year. Great. Thank you. With that, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gallego. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Acting Secretary Shanahan, a number of officials have uh, appeared before this committee and have said that the decision on reprimands and awards related to the Niger raid debacle rests with you. When Secretary Maz resigned late last year, we understood uh, that he was furious at the initial recommendations to place, blame, to place blame on junior officers, allowing more senior officers to escape responsibility. When will you make a decision about these reprimands and awards? Uh, <clears throat> Congressman, when I came into this role. Just answer the question, when will you make the decision? That's simple. S soon. What is soon? I've been. What's yeah. soon? What, what do you find as soon? I was going to explain. Okay, go ahead. Okay. When I came into this role, the recommendation was brought to me that Secretary Mattis had, had, he had convened a review, and that recommendation was brought to me. I did not find that sufficient, so I've convened my own review so I can ensure from top to bottom there's the appropriate accountability. I do not know when that will be complete, but I have to assume that much of the work that's been done to date can be used. So by saying soon, I'm not trying to okay. lead you. So just to be clear, yeah. you will be issuing a report. I want to, uh, or you will be issuing it out. And part of that is we're going to assure that it's not just going to be placing blame on junior officers. Because what it seems to me is that we're going to place blame on junior officers and we're letting colonels and general officers just get off the hook right. uh, for this debacle. Right. I hope that's going to be part of this. That, that's the reason, the fundamental reason that I've done this is for every person between the boots on the ground to the most senior position, I want a, a direct accounting. Okay. So. And just to kind of put more fine points to this, last year, the NDA required a report containing a list of all recommendations implemented following the raid. It hasn't been done. It's overdue. When will I receive that? When would this committee receive that? I'll, I'll take that for the record. Okay. And just, you know, more for the record, because it does concern me that if I don't ask these questions, we don't get any answers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we consistently have this problem where I'm asking about Niger, what happened there, what should be, what should be uh, the lessons we learned from that. Um, this committee has not used subpoena power mm -hmm. uh, in quite some time. Uh, but if this continues uh, to be the case uh, that we are having to go back and forth and I have to keep asking you for the information, I will be pushing for that. These families, the American public deserve to know exactly what happened, and the junior officers uh, that are being reprimanded right now should know that there's going to be equal uh, uh, reprimands, especially for general officers, should they, have been, should they have done anything wrong. Moving on. Last night, the committee received a copy of your letter to DHS Secretary Nielsen approving support of up to $1 billion in projects in Yuma and El Paso. In your letter, you say that DHS request meets the statutory requirements of 10 U.S.C. 284, noting DHS has identified each project area as a drug smelling corridor. Mm -hmm. Okay, question. Did you just take DHS at its words that these areas met such criteria, or did you actually do research or your staff do research to actually meet that criteria? Uh, we, we did uh, research, but in addition, after the national de emergency was declared, Chairman Dunford and I went down to El Paso and walked the areas where the 284 money will be applied and spoke with CBP personnel like uh, Aaron Hole, who's the uh, sector chief 
I think that's uh, sector nine. Great. And now, to what kind of information documentation do they provide for you to uh, support this conclusion? David, you want to answer that? Yeah, we'll, we'll have to. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Did you or the DOD do any analysis or verification of this information? Chairman? Hey, Congressman, we, we, uh, we went physically, just to make sure we're not talking past each other, we went physically to the areas uh, where the infrastructure uh, is proposed. Uh, well, see the need. General, I, yeah, I'm glad that you went and physically saw it, but you know there also needs to be other conclusive study that you could do besides just physically seeing. I am from a border state. I go to the border all the time, but there should actually be other information well, there is. that is gathered. Yeah. Okay, so that, is. that was, you, you used that to make this determination. We went down, we had, we had the information from Department of Homeland Security on the challenges they face in the specific areas wherein those challenges occur. Great. And then the infrastructure is tailored to the specific geographic area and the threat that exists within that geographic area. We had that information before we went down to physically see what we had read about before we went down to the border. Great. I really appreciate that we have that information, that you have the information, and also I would like for you to share that information uh, and all the analysis and all the detail uh, with this committee so we could see where the basis of this argument uh, came from. With that, I yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Dunford, let me just join with the other people who said that we are very grateful to you for your service to your country. And I want to thank you particularly for your service as chairman. You've been a great partner with those of us on the committee, and I deeply appreciate what you've done in conjunction with us. I would like to go back to your colloquy uh, with Mr. Thornberry to clarify one point. You mentioned the detailed analysis behind your assessment of the 3 to 5 percent real growth requirement and that this budget represents 2.9 percent growth. Now, as the 3 to 5 percent, is that the minimum amount the Forest Service accomplished the missions we ask of them? It is, uh, it is Congress. When we, when we say 3 to 5 percent, uh, that's to maintain the current competitive advantage. Again, the margin has eroded over time, slightly increased our competitive advantage over time. Obviously, more resources we, would result in a more decisive competitive advantage, but we actually identified that as the minimal necessary to make sure we could do what must be done by 2025. And the reason I wanted that clarification is when we get into budget discussions, a lot of times we start talking about wants and needs. And we're just trying to make sure when we tell our colleagues that this is a need, that this is not a want, you're telling us this is the minimum. Congressman, I am. And again, uh, I think it's important for the members of the committee to know when we say competitive advantage what we mean. So I am talking about our ability to project power in the context of the threat posed by either Russia or China in Europe or the Pacific, as the case may be. And I'm also talking about our ability to do what must be done on land, air, sea, space, and cyberspace. So when we looked at the aggregate capabilities of both Russia and China, and we looked at the capabilities we needed to develop over time, we, we, we based the figure not on math, we based the figure on the capabilities we needed in the projection of what investment would be necessary in order for us to field those capabilities. Right. Thank you for that clarification. Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for all the support you've given to the space-based ba aspects of, def of missile defense. Uh, that's vitally important, not only to ballistic missile defense, but also to hypersonic defense, which all of us are becoming more concerned about. I am confused, though, by the fact that Congress added more money last year for the space central layer to help MDA meet their hypersonic defense requirements, yet the proposed budget zeroes that out. Apparently, part of the Space Central layer will be housed in the new Space Development Agency that was established three weeks ago, but it doesn't have a dedicated funding line for this project. That seems to run counter to congressional intent, but more importantly displays a lack of priority to a program that most of us feel we desperately need to be able to defend against Russian and Chinese hypersonics. Maybe I've misunderstood this, so if you would please explain the reasoning behind the budget request. Yeah, not. <coughs> I'll have to go back and look at where the funding line is, but Dr. Griffin and I have made funding of the space layer for tracking of hypersonics a priority. So, uh, David, I don't know if you know where yeah, that Mr. funding... Mr. can answer, yeah. that would be helpful. Well, let me, to answer the level you need, we'll take that for the record, but there are things related to missile defense, as you point out, are now going to be part of the Space Development Agency. The one you're talking about is one of them. It may not be broken out in a, in a way that makes it as clear, so let's take that for the record and make sure we get you a complete answer, okay. sir. If you would, please, and once you make a determination about that, would you let the committee know? Yes, sir. It would be very helpful. Thank you. 
the, uh, Mr. Secretary, the mission of the Space Development Agency is to collaborate with the Joint Warfighter to define the next generation space architecture, foster growth in the space industrial base, and leverage commercial allied space technology. I support all those priorities. But they seem like acquisition authorities. Why is housing SDA under research and engineering the right place? It's, it's the, <clears throat> it's a temporary home. So at, as the Space Force proposal evolves, you know, part of that was to get the leadership of Dr. Griffin engaged. Dr. Griffin has a significant track record in space. I'm a big supporter of Dr. Griffin. Right, He's right. superb for that position. Right, right. So, so, you know, a couple of things. Not only does he have significant experience in space, but his work initially with SDIO and how the Missile Defense Agency was stood up so they had the right acquisition authorities and the ability to do development. This is not about doing acquisition. This is really about development. So, so think of him as overseeing the creation of the right structure. This is really about the, the balance of putting appropriate authorities in place. If, if we get the wrong mix, it's just going to slow us down. So we're really relying on, on his experience and judgment to help us put the right pieces in place. That's, that's how I look at it. Thank you. I yeah. yield back. Thank you, Mr. Moulton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's getting to be a familiar tune, but I want to thank uh, all of you for your service and especially Chairman Dunford. Uh, I'm honored to have you there as a fellow Marine, and we're very lucky as a country uh, that you continue to serve. And I, too, uh, share the hope, a bipartisan hope on this committee that you would find some way to continue that service uh, past your, your due time. Um, Mr. Secretary, um, Mr. Acting Secretary, I'd like to start with you. Um, China and Russia have made major advancements in their conventional capabilities since the Cold War and significant investments in emerging technologies like hypersonics, AI, and cyber. It's one of the things I really like about your budget that you are investing in these things as well. Um, where do we have the strongest advantage against our competitors right now? I think probably at the uh, most uh, basic level, I would say undersea. And so what are we doing to ensure we maintain that advantage? Well, we continue to invest. You know, a lot of the things that are very unique and special, we won't be able to talk about in here, but we are investing in very significant capabilities. I think where, you know, I would go with the, the critical capabilities that we need to make in terms of really leveraging. You know, the chairman talks about our, uh, our competitive advantage. Space, cyber, and missiles are where we can enable a significant gain, not just in terms of capability, but deterrence. Right, so I take your point, uh, Mr. Acting Secretary, Mr. Acting Secretary yeah. which is that it's really these traditional places like undersea capabilities where we have our advantage today, and that's why we need to make these, um, these new investments. So as we think about making these new investments in things like cyber and AI and, and, and hypersonics, what new arms control regimes that incorporate these emerging technologies could be, inter could be in our strategic interest moving forward? Yeah, this, this is where we need to do, in, in my view, the most significant work. You know, we'll... Uh, We'll address the INF and, and New START, but things like New START don't contemplate artificial intelligence or these new weapons like hypersonics that have been created. So you think it's critical that we incorporate these types of weapon systems into new arms control agreements? We, we need to really think, what does machine on machine mean as we take humans out of the loop? And, and these are arms control agreements that we need to have with people that we don't have arms control agreements with. Right. Right. Uh, there's also a lot of debate on this uh, committee about the nuclear moderniz modernization. Um, how much money could we save in nuclear modernization if we had to, if we were able to negotiate a bilateral reduction in ICBMs uh, with Russia? I I don't know where where to start in terms of calculating. Would it be that. significant? I mean, if all nuclear weapons went away in the world, would, would there? Well, not all, but if we were able to re to, to negotiate a reduction. It, it always depends on which, right? I mean, I mean, the the, ba the basic uh, 
answer is, if you don't have to develop something, you save money. I mean, arm, arm, arms control agreements have value if you can avoid having to develop something you don't need. Sure, sure. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to also take this discussion to alliances, not just arms control, but alliances that we have around the globe. Um, I strongly believe, and I suspect you agree, in a strategy built on strong alliances and growing partnerships. Uh, despite massive investments in advanced weaponry ships and aircraft in the FY20 proposal, what investments are we making to counter Chinese influence globally? Um, and how is that reflected in the, in the administration's budget request? Uh, Congressman, I, I think you answered the question. And, and uh, when you look at the European Defense Initiative as an example, you look at the exercise program, our foreign military sales uh, assistance and so forth, it's all designed to reinforce that network of allies and partners. And that, that is, uh, as you've identified in my view, the critical strategic advantage that we have over China, if we talk just China specifically, is our network of allies and partners. So what are we doing as China uh, has their One Belt, One Road uh, proposal that they're, uh, that they're pursuing aggressively with significant investments? What are we doing to counter that growing influence in Asia, in Africa, uh, in, in other places where they are making Marshall Plan-sized investments in potential allies? Mr. Chairman, could you take that? I can, I can talk to the military dimension of it, uh, Congressman, because I think what you're highlighting is a, is a broader uh, gap in our overall political and economic approach that, that is still being worked. There's, there's a strategic approach, but we have a lot of work to do to, to keep pace with the One Belt, One Road in terms of a comprehensive political, economic, and security package. In the security space, it is uh, the work that we're doing with the allies and partners, and, and I would argue that I certainly spend probably 60 percent of my time, without an exaggeration, uh, doing that, and I think the Secretary is, is probably pretty close to half his time as well uh, in dealing with our allies and partners and building those relationships, building that interoperability. And certainly, uh, you know, I've got, I think, 22 liaison officers on my staff from other countries right now, and all of our exercise design and so forth is all now uh, to incorporate coalition capabilities into our exercises. So from a military perspective, we're very mindful of the need to broaden uh, and deepen uh, these allies and partners, and everything that we do is actually informed by that. I'm out of time, and, but Mr. Shanahan, if you could just take I'm, that I'm question sorry. for the record the as well. I'm sorry. The gentleman's time has expired, so if there are any other questions, that have to be taken for the record. Um, we'll go to Ms. Stefanik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Dunford, thank you for your tremendous leadership and service to our nation. Uh, you will be sorely missed on this committee. It's been a privilege to work with you. Uh, my question is for Secretary Shanahan. I wanted to follow up on Mr. Moulton. With nearly a decade of China making, sufficient, making significant investments in AI, quantum, and other emerging technologies, why is our top line number so important to ensure that in the long term we are able to fight and win against near peer adversaries like China? Thank you for that question. Modernization is the most important thing we can do to maintain deterrence, create military capability, but that's also what enables us economically. So they really all tie together. And I think, going back to the, the congressman's question, what, what I think you would find in the Department of Defense as we're doing great power competition is it's not just about conducting military exercises. How do we work with partners in the regions where we're providing security to unlock economic capability and develop economic relationships? The relationships we form through the department really can unlock some of those other diplomatic or economic benefits. So we're strictly, I mean, we're not looking at these great power competitions as the military is the solution. The military is an enabler to unlocking diplomatic and, and new, new relationships, but that top line in these critical areas, particularly cyber, are fundamental. Thank you. My next question is on a different subject. For the past five years, there has been broad bipartisan and bicameral support for the designation of an East Coast Missile Defense Site, mm -hmm. yet the Department has not made any such designation available to this committee. Mm -hmm. The environmental impact study has been completed, and the threat to our homeland from rogue nations, ICBMs, continues to evolve, mm -hmm. and the requirements for increasing the engagement envelope and allowing for a shoot-look-shoot 
con ops is more imperative than ever. Congressional intent in the last NDAA was that the site designation after the EIS would be released. So I expect the department will indeed respect that congressional intent and share this designation with the committee. Can I count on that? You can. And my last question, um, give me one second here. So I also wanted to get you on record. Do you agree that any addition of a CONUS interceptor site must enhance current capabilities to protect the entire continental U.S. by expanding the battle space and projecting power on the East Coast? The key question is, yeah. any third site must protect the entire continental U.S. Do you agree with that? Let me, let me take that one for the record. Okay, I believe that is incredibly right. important that as we are considering right. no. any potential uh, location, right. that it should protect the entire continental U.S. No, I understand. And my, my hesitancy is when you look at uh, coverages and what threat we're protecting against, that it's more a refinement of the answer that, that, you're, uh, that you're requesting. Yeah, I would just make a plug for the success the Missile Defense Agency had yesterday in a probably one of their more complex tests of the ground-based mid-course defense system, uh, of which that would probably be an important baseline. But I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you with, with that answer. Okay. Thank you yeah. for that. I yield back. Mr. Garamendi. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we recently returned from a trip to uh, Jordan, Iraq, Kurdistan, and Kuwait. In Jordan, we observed and looked at and uh, talked with the Jordanians about a $350 million investment that the Defense Threat Agency, Reduction Agency, made to create a virtual 21st century border wall along the 300 plus miles of the Jordanian Syrian border uh, to keep out drug smugglers, armament smugglers, as well as ISIS. By all accounts, uh, the utilization of electronic surveillance equipment, command and control, rapid reduction, or rapid reaction capabilities proved to be extraordinarily effective. Now, we're in the process of transferring some $8 billion from the Department of Defense to build a less than 300 miles of border wall. So my questions to you really are about the wall it's our understanding that last night the Department of Defense said a notification of its intent to reprogram funds and use from 10 USC, UCS, USC, 284 to construct portions of a border wall. We also understand that the Department of Defense may start awarding contracts using funding pursuant to 10 USC 2808 as early as May. Uh, can you therefore explain in more detail the status of your plans to build a border wall pursuant to 2808. Specifically, have you made any determination that the supposed national emergency requires the use of armed forces, Mr. Secretary? If so, why? So the, the status of 2808 is I've received a request from the Department of Homeland Security. And part of the process for me to make a determination is I've tasked the chairman to do an analysis of that request, he will come back to me and provide a military recommendation. Chairman? Okay. Have you made no. any determinations that a border wall is necessary, necessary to support the use of troops at the border? Hmm. Mr. Dunford, yeah. Chairman, excuse me, General. Uh, Congressman, just to make sure I'm answering the question directly. So uh, we're responding to the President's direction to reinforce Department of Homeland Security because they have capability and capacity shortfalls. So to that extent, we have responded to requests for assistance for U.S. military personnel. So we have determined that U.S. personnel uh, can appropriately backfill the capability gaps and capacity size gaps that Homeland Security has. My to question date. is somewhat different. It's have you made any determination that the border wall is necessary to support those troops? Oh, no, that's exactly uh, what, the, what the Secretary has tasked me to do now, Congressman, is to, is to look at the legislation, which I did yesterday, and determine whether the projects that have been identified by Department of Homeland Security would be uh, enhancing the Department of Defense's mission. Okay. 
Next, have you or anyone else at the department had any discussions or made any comments about needing to send or keep troops at the border in order to justify using Section 2808 to build a border wall? Uh, I certainly haven't, Congressman. Very good. Next, what border wall projects will be built with Section 2808 funds, i.e., where along the border will the wall be built with these funds? Are these sections of the border wall military installations? If so, why? Uh, Congressman, we have, uh, to tell you where we are in the process, so we have a list of projects identified by the Department of Homeland Security, but, but the Secretary has not yet identified which of those aggregate projects that DHS has identified would be funded by 2808. And I'll go back to where I started this conversation. We observed 350 or 40 miles of virtual border wall that is successful between Jordan and Syria in what is, without doubt, one of the most dangerous places in the world, successfully operating at a cost of 300 and $40 million, something for all of us to think about. Uh, finally, uh, I would just observe that the uh, United States Constitution is extraordinarily clear about who has the power of appropriation. It is not the President, and the President is usurping the power, and you're part of that usurpation of power. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Shanahan, Chairman Dunford, thank you both for your testimony this afternoon. Chairman Dunford, uh, to the maximum extent you are able to in this setting, and I recognize there are limitations, can you explain the espionage threat posed by Huawei and ZTE on the transfer of U.S. data and voice communications over their networks? Uh, I can, Congressman. If you, if you think about the implications, uh, are you talking in the future with 5G yeah. in particular? So if you, if you think about the implications of 5G, the Internet of Things, uh, as well as the, the uh, primary means that we'll use to share information and intelligence with our allies and partners, one of the critical uh, aspects of 5G has to be assurance that it's a secure network. Uh, if not, we'll have vulnerabilities and capabilities that we field in the future that will leverage 5G. And probably as importantly, a foundational element of an alliance is the ability to share securely information and intelligence. And, uh, and it'll be much more difficult uh, for us to have those kinds of assurances to facilitate exchange of information uh, given, given the trends with, uh, with China's influence. So it would be fair then to say that there are military operational processes that you are worried about as you look forward to operating with partners and allies that may be using Huawei systems? Congressman, I, yes. And this is a broad, fundamental national security issue, and it needs to be a fulsome debate on exactly where we're headed. I, I, I do believe that the, uh, the vulnerabilities are acute. And what steps has the DOD, has DOD undertaken already, or could you possibly undertake to mitigate these threats? Well, yeah, maybe I'll pick up on this. and. Maybe if I could just uh, add to the, the chairman's uh, comments. So if we look at 5G and then the environment that uh, those systems are developed and where they come from, you're talking about a country that has a clear history of cyber espionage. We're talking about a country with predatory economics. We're talking about uh, you know, looking at you know, uh, people having to have a social credit that <laughs> Part of doing business over there is you have to share data. With, with that as the backdrop and then not having the understanding of how you can trust the network, that's our concern with, with 5G from a Department of Defense standpoint. So in the absence of being able to verify that hardware or a provider is trustworthy, the things that we're going to have to do is have secure networks that keep that equipment off of that. But the real risk is we have to operate in environments where we don't know how secure that network is. And this is where we get into discussions with our NATO partners and, and other countries. As they pursue economic advantages of purchasing low-cost equipment, they're forgoing security. And, and that's, I think, our biggest concern. Sure. And in light of those concerns, would you recommend that American technology companies sell critical enabling components to firms like Huawei and ZTE? Well, I I'm always for America selling 
the right, the right equipment. I think the real work we have to do here is we were, as a country, the leaders with 4G. Mm -hmm. We should be the leaders with 5G. I mean, it's not only in our security interest, but it's in our economic interest to be able to have that kind of capability. And then, uh, Chairman Dunford, uh, you talked about sort of the concerns that we would have if we're working with allies, even close allies, that have uh, technology from Huawei and ZTE. I think the, the Aussies, uh, who are uh, one of our closest allies, we celebrated 100 years of mateship last year, um, have been at the lead in sort of disallowing China from, from competing uh, in Australia for 5G technology. Uh, my understanding is uh, uh, New Zealand may follow suit. Talk to me about where the Five Eyes Alliance is uh, on this critical question, because it's my, my theory that we should start there and then build outwards to our NATO allies. Yeah, sure, Congressman. Uh, in fact, Sunday night at my home, I'll have the Five Eyes, my Five Eye counterparts, and we're, and we're talking about, I won't talk too much in detail here, but we've been having this conversation for the last 18 months to understand where we are as a group in terms of our ability to manage uh, this, this challenge and many other challenges associated with our competitive advantage. I appreciate that, and, and I know you guys are tracking on this, this issue, which I view to be, I mean, perhaps the most important one we face right now. So thank you for your attention to it, and thank you for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you. And I yield the balance of my time. Mr. Carvajal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chairman Dumford, let me, uh, too, add my thanks for your service. I think your exodus is going to be greatly, um, we're going to greatly miss you. And I do hope, uh, as was said earlier, that we find some way to keep you engaged, um, as I think that'll be important for our national security. Acting Secretary Shanahan, military construction is defined in the law as any construction, development, conversion, or extension of any kind carried out with respect to a military installation necessary to produce a complete and usable facility. I imagine it is pretty rigorous of a selective process and must prove to be important to the well-being and readiness of service members. As the law states, the purpose of these funds are to produce usable facilities for our military. Correct me if I'm wrong, but getting a project selected to receive MILCON funding is pretty difficult. And in most situations, it takes years before installation commanders actually get MILCON projects funded and included in their budgets. Diverting MILCON funding hampers the department's and Congress' ability to sustain what you all have been stressing is readiness, and as the Commandant of the Marine Corps has alluded to. Congress did its job by authorizing and appropriating funds for MILCON projects that the department and members of Congress saw as vital to the safety and readiness of our service members. And what we are being told is that this funding is not going to be used where the law clearly states it should be used. Secretary Shanahan, you are asking this body to authorize $3.6 billion to backfill projects we already authorized and appropriated. In addition, you are requesting another $3.6 billion to build the wall. How did the Department of Defense get into the business of funding a physical wall for what you all consider is a non-military emergency? That was a rhetorical question. Moving on to Venezuela. Is the use of military assets to deliver humanitarian aid and services being used to send a signal to Russia and other foreign entities of this administration's intent to solve the crisis in Venezuela militarily, one? And two, does the DOD have any plans or intentions of sending additional support other than humanitarian aid supported by U.S. aid? And three, has the DOD been given any requirements for assistance to fulfill from other agencies? So the, uh, the use of uh, the military for humanitarian assistance is vital. And I think one of the reasons that we were drawn in by the State Department was, was because we could do this so quickly. To your question regarding you know, other plans and activities as they relate to supporting Venezuela, the chairman and I have been in, in discussion for the, the last several weeks. You know, how do we put a more regional face on uh, our humanitarian efforts? I'll be going down to uh, Southern Command 
to uh, meet with Admiral Fowler to have further discussions around what are the things that we can do to provide support to the people of Venezuela. Chairman, do you have any comments? The only I'd say, Congressman, is your first question about was it designed to signal we got the request and it, it was generated by USAID. It went to the State Department and they asked us to meet a capacity shortfall. And as the Secretary said, it was our ability to deliver a large volume over a short period of time in support of USAID, which drove that initial uh, humanitarian assist request. Let me finish with the time I have left. Is it this administration's intent to use the military resolution on this issue? To achieve a military resolution? It's not my understanding. Thank you. Yeah. I yield back my time. Okay, one, we have five people left to, to ask questions here um, who have not yet spoken. Um, I'm gonna press on. There's the possibility that others are going to come back and we'll deal with that as it comes, but we'll try to press on. I think we can conceivably get done in the next 45 minutes or so, so I'll try and do that. Mr. Walls. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your service. Uh, and thank you for being here today. I wanna talk to you a moment about space. Uh, Russia and China have weaponized space. They're in, they have done so, they're in the process of doing so, and they, and they explicitly in their national security strategy seek to dominate uh, the United States in space. They are prepared for war, and in my opinion, we are not. Uh, so with the flip of a switch, China can track, they can dazzle, they can destroy our assets in space. In 2018, China conducted more space launches than any other, uh, than any other country in the world. Uh, why does this matter? I think as, as leaders, we need to to help Americans understand that our entire modern way of life is dependent uh, on space now. Our navigation, our supply chain, our banking, how we communicate, Space Foundation says over $400 billion of our economy is now dependent on space. Yet in the Pentagon, our various components for war fighting in that domain are all over the place. Uh, GAO uh, estimated we have over 60 stakeholders involved in this organization in terms of acquisition, oversight, and the Air Force is 11 different parts. I personally believe we are with space where we were in the 1940s with the Air Force, where it had to be split off from the Air Corps for uh, all kinds of reasons that are now obvious. I have uh, introduced legislation that cleans up some past legislation in terms of making it a fully unified command versus the subordinate command. I would encourage my, my colleagues to support me in that. Bottom line, gentlemen, and I'll go with you, Mr. Secretary, are we prepared, are you confident that we could win a conflict in space today if we had to do so? I'm fully confident we could win a conflict in space today. Are you compare, Are you, without the current budget trajectory, for example, if we had to go to a continuing resolution, are you confident that we could win in space in the next five to ten years given Chinese investments? We just don't need to take that risk. I mean, this is really about we have a nineteen trillion dollar economy that runs on space. We need. That's why the a CR would be so painful. We we've put a plan in place. The three to five percent growth that we the real growth that we need allows us to even go faster. Yeah. But it's it's vital that we get that top line. Mr. Secretary, have you made a decision on where the new U.S. Space Command will be located? There's reporting in the press that it will be in Colorado and yeah. that there's been a nomination. Yeah, no, there's... there's. I would uh, submit to you yeah. spaces in Florida's DNA yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, to, yeah. Strongly, right. uh, to strongly consider Florida as, as you move forward with, with that decision. Break, break. Uh, separate topic on counterterrorism, capacity building, soft power. Uh, I would just submit to you that, and I'm concerned in hearing testimony uh, across the board from across the services, that I understand where we're going with the national defense strategy. I think that's the right place, the right thing to do in terms of, of reinvesting in our technological superiority. However, we cannot do what we did in the 1980s post-Vietnam and flush those lessons, those counterinsurgency, those counterterrorism lessons uh, down the tubes. Gentlemen, uh, General Dunford, do you believe ISIS is defeated as a military organization? ISIS maintains uh, global capability, uh, Congressman, so while they've been cleared of the ground in Syria, in Iraq, it remains a threat. Do you believe Al-Qaeda is defeated? 
Uh, no, I don't, uh, Congressman. Do you believe that in your military advice that the Taliban forget, forget their political will, that they have the military capability to deny Al Qaeda use of Afghanistan, and, and particularly a military capability that a 300,000 man Afghan army and a coalition, coalition of the most powerful Western armies in the world have struggled to do in 18 years. And I've certainly participated in, and I know you have as well. Do you believe the Taliban have that capability if we bought into the fact that they desire to do so? Yeah, Congressman, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not pushing back on your question, but it's hard for me to imagine having a conversation about the Taliban fighting Al Qaeda, given how close they are uh, as organizations right now. Right. I 100 percent agree. First, we have to get over to we buy. They have the will to deny Al Qaeda Afghanistan as a launching pad into, into back in the United States. Then we have to look at what's their enforcement mechanism, what's their uh, capability. Gentlemen, just with the time I have remaining, I'm glad that you touched on the fact that if we had to go to a national emergency today from a recruiting standpoint, 75 percent of young people couldn't serve in the military. That's why I'm, I'm pushing for, to go, for us to go back to national service. That's not a draft, that's national service as a means to prepare our young people to serve in all types of capacities and look forward to working with you in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to all of you for your testimony today. And I will reiterate uh, my colleague's comments, General Dunford, on your lifetime of service. I thank you for uh, your professionalism. And with all due respect to my colleague from Florida, Colorado is a mile closer to space than Florida is, and a great place for space assets. Um, let me begin uh, with uh, General Dunford. Uh, in my three combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, doing counterterrorism, counterinsurgency operations, you know, it became abundantly clear to me that um, involvement of humanitarian and diplomatic efforts and resources were instrumental to our ability to get the job done uh, and to secure our forces and our allies as well. Uh, so in that context, uh, is it your professional judgment and in your experience that if the proposed cuts to the State Department would occur, would that have a negative impact on our stability and support operations and our national security? Yeah, Congressman, first, with, the, with regard to the first part of your question, I couldn't agree with you more, and my experience is very similar to yours. I, I'm not familiar enough to know uh, how Secretary Pompeo, uh, how his budget is constructed and what the direct impact is uh, of the cuts to the State Department to be able to judge whether that will have a direct impact on our, our operations. Well, if we have fewer diplomats, for fewer resources uh, to supplement our forces and to provide a capacity building to our allies and our local partners, does that jeopardize our uh, ability to perform our missions overseas? That particular shortfall would, there's no question. Uh, and also with, uh, to you, General Dunford, um, uh, I'm particularly concerned about the long-term security of our Kurdish allies, particularly the Syrian, Syrian Democratic Forces uh, in, uh, in Syria. Uh, are, are you satisfied that as of today, there are sufficient long-term plans in place to ensure the protection of the Kurds uh, and our allies, uh, in particular the SDF forces. No, oh, thanks, Congressman. And in, in, in Syria specifically, you know, we're seeking campaign continuity. And that campaign continuity includes the partnership with the SDF to complete the task against ISIS. We're also working to assure uh, Turkey that its security interests uh, are addressed along the border. And so right now, uh, our near-term plan with the President's decision for residual force includes continued train advise assist for, the, uh, for, our, for our Kurdish uh, partners on the ground, uh, as well as a framework that will prevent uh, any challenges or threats to them. So it sounds like we're working on it, but we're not there yet. Yeah, uh, Congressman, I would tell you if I come here six months from now, I'll tell you we're still working on it. This is a journey, not a destination. I mean, we continue to make refinements to the plan. It's a very, as you know, uh, personally, it's a very complicated situation, and I think we make progress every day, uh, but I suspect we'll continue to work this for months to come, keeping in mind the thesis of your opening line, which was, at the end of the day, this is about a political solution, uh, which is very much uh, still in the works. Well, I'll just uh, posit that I think our moral credibility as well as our security will be tied up with our ability to protect uh, those forces and that population. Uh, and uh, Acting Secretary Shanahan, uh, you know, I'm deeply concerned about uh, mission creep and the use of the AUMF over the last 18 years. 
uh, and obviously Congress has authority to, to declare war and oversight authority of the Department of Defense and, and military operations. It's my understanding that execute orders or exords, which outline operational authorities delegated by the secretary to commanders or components have previously not been made accessible to committee staff. And we can't do our oversight role unless committee staff has that information. Uh, so uh, will you commit to be able to provide those timely to committee staff? Uh, Congressman, I have been working over the past six weeks to come up with a process so that we can share that information, and I'm going to be prepared next month to come share that and, and work with the committee. So staff. next month is the goal? Yeah, that's okay. the goal. And why has the department not fulfilled its obligation and submitted the congressionally mandated report on advise, assist, and accompany missions? Mm -hmm. I'll have to take that for the record. And that's uh, Section 1212 of a fiscal year 19 NDAA, okay. just to be right. clear. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I see we, we do have some folks coming back. So we're going to go with Mr. Bergman. Uh, and then when he is done, we are going to take a 10 to 50 minute where you give the witnesses a chance um, to uh, stretch um, and relax for a moment. And then we will reconvene um, at yeah, 12, 1245 um, and go from there. And with that, Mr. Bergman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, General Dunford. I know you've heard it from everyone, but thank you for, for being the embodiment of servant leadership, thoughtful, pragmatic, mission-focused. Um, you've set an example that we all can follow on a daily basis. Thanks. Um, Mr. Shanahan. Uh, the subject in advance here as I work through the question is PFAS contamination. In my district in Michigan, Alpena, Grayling, Marquette, Escanaba, we have areas of confirmed and potential PFAS contamination, some including BRACT bases, which closed decades ago, but also at state-owned National Guard facilities. As you already know, the Army and the Air uh, National Guard don't have access to the department's uh, environmental restoration funds the same way the active component bases uh, do. Given that the work of our National Guard, uh, that it, what it does is directly related to overall readiness of our armed forces, I believe that the DOD does have a role to play in mitigating PFAS contamination. Uh, do you agree, uh, Secretary Shanahan, that, that we must find ways to address uh, PFAS contamination, not just at active duty bases, but also at National Guard facilities? Sir, I think that uh, we need to address the issue of PFAS, uh, PFOA contamination writ large in all of our communities. This is a, a significant uh, health and uh, environmental uh, risk. Yeah. Can you give me any examples of how um, DOD is currently working with other agencies to address the issue? Yep. I know the uh, department is working with the Environmental Protection Agency to harmonize some of the, uh, the standards. Our, our focus has been to uh, substitute. So when you think about the, uh, the, the fire retardant, how do we you know, just eliminate the, the contamination? So we no longer test, we no longer uh, train. We no longer do research with uh, those chemicals. I understand. And is there anything, because Congress is a partner in this, mm -hmm. is there anything that you would suggest, and you can take this for the record if you'd like, yeah. what Congress can do to further support DOD in ensuring that you have the ability to work with all of those other agencies to eliminate this problem? No, I'll, I'll take that for the record, but I, it, it's one of these we truly need to get a harmonization of the environmental mitigation plans. I mean, we just, we need to be able to address it, but I'll take that for the record. Thank you. Uh, General Dunford, um, you know, it's clear that the national defense strategy has, has influenced this budget as is, does with every budget, but what is less clear is how the joint force plans to operate differently. Uh, can you explain uh, in, a, in an unclassified way some of the concepts that are being developed to oper operationalize the strategy, you know, update the old plans and combining with budget. Sure. Uh, probably, since you talk about old plans, probably one of the more fundamental changes that we made is to shift from an old plan basis method of planning 
to campaign plans that incorporate the whole problem set. So in the past, we might have developed a plan for a specific contingency in a specific geographic area, a fairly narrow uh, view of the threat. When we think about Russia, China, Iran, North Korea now, our planning has, has we develop global plans so that we uh, talk about a specific contingency, but we talk about it in the context of what the entire joint force will be doing globally at, the, at any given point in time. I'll just very quickly give you an example. So when we have done recently a readiness review for our preparedness for Korea, we not only looked at Korea, we looked at what we were doing across the region in the Pacific, what we were doing to defend the homeland, and what each of the combatant commanders would be doing outside of the theater, either in direct support of that contingency or as that contingency goes on to mitigate the risk of opportunism and, and, uh, and other risk. Thank you. And I guess I'm the only one standing between you, us on a break, so I yield back. <laughs> okay. Um, we are going to take a brief rest, recess in a moment. We will reconvene at, do you guys need 10, 15 minutes? What, sorry, 10. Okay, we'll reconvene at 1240. Uh, Mr. Brown is going to be in the chair for a while. I have something I have to do, but I will be back. Um, and Mr. Brown is first up, so he's not really just putting himself in charge and then calling on himself. He actually is next. Um, so we are in recess for 10 minutes. Thank you.
pick up uh, where we left off, as the chairman mentioned. Uh, I was next in order, so I'll begin with uh, my line of uh, questions. And let me just start by saying that I think, you know, I recognize it as, you know, members of the Armed Services Committee, our responsibility is to look at authorizations uh, for uh, underlying supporting the national defense strategy, and that the national defense strategy uh, really implements one of the four pillars of the national security strategy. That's peace through strength with a focus on building a more lethal force. Uh, as we, um, as members of Congress more broadly, are looking at how do we ensure that we authorize and appropriate for the entire national security strategy, uh, which includes defending the homeland, a lot of defense and non-defense spending that's in there, American prosperity, a lot of non-defense spending in there, uh, and projecting American values. In fact, if you look at the national security strategy, it talks about vocational training. It talks about diversifying the uh, energy portfolio. It talks about a forward presence of the diplomatic corps and our development activities uh, throughout the world. Uh, so let me turn, though, to the focus of you know, this committee, the national defense uh, strategy and, and the underlying budget. Uh, this year, the President's budget request is for $750 billion, 718 to the Pentagon, um, and uh, which is uh, the highest adjusted for infl inflation since the height of the Iraq War. Uh, An overseas contingency, um, it includes an OCO funding of $174 billion, $164 billion to the Pentagon, uh, which is the absolute highest that we've seen uh, since uh, the height of the Iraq surge in 2007 and 2008. Um, and this is a, a occurring at the same time that the national defense strategy um, is talking about a pivot away from uh, the counterterrorism fight, not abandoning that fight, but pivoting away as we focus more on great power competition uh, and uh, with China and Russia. I think it's important for Congress that you know, we are uh, open and, and transparent to the American public and that the Department of Defense is as well. So when we have appropriations categories and authorization accounts uh, that we can demonstrate to the American people that we're faithful to the uh, original design and intent. So I just want to ask you about a few items just to shine some light on what we're actually doing here, what's being requested in the, in the President's budget request. I'm reading. $8 billion for ship depot level maintenance has been moved from the Navy base budget to the OCO account. And to my knowledge, there's not a single dollar for depot level maintenance in the base budget. Is that accurate? Uh, I believe that sounds correct. Okay. $1.2 billion for Trident II mi nuclear missiles in the overseas contingency operation funds. Is that accurate? It, it is, it'd be in the OCO for base, correct? Yeah, it's in the OCO, Overseas Contingency Allowance, Trident Missiles. 533 B61 low to medium yield nuclear bombs are in the OCO portion of the budget. Is that accurate? I don't know that one off the top of my head. Sir. Yeah, that is accurate. I'll answer that one. There's $1 billion for the Patriot missile system, the OCO budget. The Patriot, as you know, is to defend against advanced enemy fighters. We're talking about in, a, in an overseas contingency operation fund. Does that sound accurate? That may be right. The uh, Patriot is also used in terms of defensive facilities and bases against missiles. And then finally, I want to point out the European Deterrence Initiative, 500 million remains in the OCO budget. I understand that it's been done that way in previous years, but again, we're talking about reassuring uh, our NATO allies about a long-term commitment, yet a substantial portion of our funding commitment is in a OCO account, which is not long-term budgeting. It's better than a CR, but it's not long-term funding. Does, does that, is that accurate? Yes, the EDI has historically been funded through that OCO account, and it was last year and in the prior years as well. So is this sound budgeting practice for the DOD and supporting a defense budget? So the the use of the, uh, the OCO is divided into two parts. The doctor earlier, there's the traditional one, and we've broken it out in the budget to make No, I, I get that. I guess that. my question is this. Putting in some of these sort of, you know, modernization programs, long-term programs that are not exclusively for current or anticipated overseas contingency allowances, putting, for example, 533 nuclear bombs in OCO, is that sound um, budgeting or, or accounting practices? 
It's not how we have presented it the previous year. Okay, let me just shift with the remaining time I have. because We haven't asked about the transgender uh, policy. I think that budgets are important, reflection of both our priorities and our values. Uh, would you agree with that, Secretary Shanahan, that a budget reflects our values and our priorities? Yes. So, you know, when President Truman desegregated the armed forces, he stated, it is essential that there be maintained in the armed services of the United States the highest standards of democracy with a quality of treatment and opportunity for all those who serve in our country's defense. Would you agree with that, Secretary Shanahan? Yes, I would. Are you aware that, and we, you've heard it today, the Army, as of September 30th, um, failed to recruit enough soldiers to meet its uh, projections for uh, the last fiscal year? Yes. And you have also heard that 71% of young Americans between age 17 and 24 are ineligible to serve in the military? That is correct. Uh, would you agree that a manpower shortage in the United States Armed Forces directly compromises national security? Yes, it does. Are you aware that there are transgender soldiers serving in today's military who are meeting and even exceeding standards in every criterion that we use to measure performance in the military? I don't have the specific. Uh, okay because they testified in front of this committee about three weeks ago. And are you aware of the fact that many of these transgender soldiers have successfully transitioned to their gender of preference? Yeah, I, I don't know that, but I... Yeah, because this is an important policy yeah. change. This isn't changing right. sort of like the army green to the army green and right. pink. Right. This is a, this is a, a, a personnel policy right. that will exclude a certain category of Americans from serving. So I'm, I'm just trying to inquire what you do know about it. Are you aware that the Chief of Naval Operations, the Marine Commandant, the Army Chief, and the current Air Force Chief all testified publicly in their own words that transgender serving in the military won't affect readiness, doesn't affect military dis discipline, has not been disruptive, uh, to the military service, nor has affected unit cohesion. Are you aware of that? I'm aware of their testimony, yes. And, are, and you know that in July of 2017, President Trump said that he consulted his generals and experts when he decided not to ac accept transgender individuals to serve in the military. General Dunford, uh, as the then senior military advisor to the president, uh, is it accurate that within days of President Trump's ban on transgender service that you stated I would just probably say that I believe any individual who meets the physical and mental standards and is worldwide deployable and is currently serving should be afforded the opportunity to continue to serve. Did you say that? Uh, I did say that, Congressman. Has, has your opinion changed on that? Uh, it has not, Congressman. I uh, will now turn to, thank you very much for your, your uh, responses to my line of questions. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, General, I, th I think since we uh, have, have gone down that road at some length over time, it is uh, important now to put on the record a bit more about uh, the process that Secretary Mattis used in uh, evaluating the prior administration's uh, policy in this regard and uh, a little bit more fulsome about the factors that were looked at, how the decisions came to be made that he issued during his time. And I don't know, either one of you, I don't know which of you is better to do that, because uh, you, were, you were both there, but I, I think it'd be important to uh, take a first discuss that stab. a bit. I'll, t I'll take a first stab at it and then, uh, and then see if the Secretary wants to add. So uh, we did use the words uh, physically, mentally, psychologically capable of being worldwide deployable without special accommodations. And then the secretary uh, engaged the leadership across the department, but that also included medical experts from across the department. And so what the secretary did was based on the definitions, and, and I think you were sensitive as well, uh, Ranking Member Thornberry, that some of this is still in uh, litigation, so what I'm trying to do is be as forthright now as I can be without, without, a, without getting into that issue. But the, but the secretary uh, included the leadership and then medical experts. And so then based on the definition of physically, mentally, psychologically uh, capable of deploying, performing in our occupational fields with the caveat without special accommodation, he proposed a revision to the 2017 policy. That was the process that was used to be able to do that. Okay. Secretary Shanahan, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think the uh, 2018 policy really just applies standards uniformly. Yeah. 
I think there's, there's a misunderstanding that the policy was changed on the whim of a tweet, and that's part of the reason I think it's helpful to, uh, for members to know that there was a deeper, longer process that was involved that resulted in the Mattis policy. Now, as y'all may know, that we're going to have a, resolu a sense of Congress resolution on the floor this week, uh, which is part of the reason that this is uh, coming up right now. I, d I don't think probably it's, it's appropriate for us to debate that now, but as you point out, there, are, there is litigation underway. I suspect there will be more conversations about these various considerations, and, and that may well involve involvement, uh, involve the department and the service chiefs in, in looking at these issues. Uh, I yield back. And we'll now go to uh, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Shanahan, have you ever had a conversation or any engagement with Secretary DeVos about sensitive research on college campuses and tools of Chinese espionage like Huawei, Confucius Institutes, et cetera? I have not with uh, Secretary uh, DeVos, but I have with uh, the FBI. Okay. Um, do you believe that there's more that we can do to restrict Chinese nationals who are, who are students on college campuses from being involved in DOD-funded sensitive research? I think there are... Are there good reasons for us to do that? Yes, there are. Okay, good. Um, I'll move on. Um, uh, Secretary Shanahan, on September 26 of last year, Secretary Mattis and, and uh, VA Secretary Wilkie issued a joint statement promising a new and improved joint governance structure to manage MHS Genesis and the v VA EHR modernization. Mm -hmm. Um, I have asked the VA officials multiple times to share the thought process and zero information has been forthcoming. Yeah. I understand that a study of various options was completed in February. When, when can we expect such an announcement I'll on take, the new EHR organization? Yeah, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that one for the record. Okay. And, and even better yet, before yeah. the announcement, is it, would it be possible for some of us who are involved in this subject to be briefed? Um, ha receive a briefing of some sort. Yeah, and, and is the uh, is the line of, of thinking where the synergies or the benefits being captured based on this unity of effort? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to another issue. Uh, Secretary Shanahan, you're, in your opening testimony, you stated, quote, we are applying maximum pressure to ISIS-K mm -hmm. and other terrorist groups in Afghanistan mm -hmm. to stymie any threats to the U.S. homeland. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on this military campaign, and how would a quick <coughs> withdrawal impact the longevity of ISIS-K in Afghanistan? Well, the, my reference there is to the work of General Miller and the Special Forces, and their work also with the Afghan Special Forces. Um, as, as you're very well familiar with General Miller's uh, soft background, he is, at this point in time, this is this anchors back to our South Asia strategy. So he's really bringing a concentrated effect, a soft presence and a more muscular effect, not just to, to Al Qaeda and ISIS, but to the Taliban. Okay, G General Dunford, uh, can you state, you state the importance of the quote, Afghan owned peace process. Do you think our current negotiations exemplify that? Hey, Congressman, uh, you know, what we need to do is start reconciliation. So what I'm optimistic about is that Ambassador Khalilazad has at least opened up a dialogue, and after 17 years, I'm encouraged to see that. Um, the intent, the clear intent, uh, that's outlined by the Secretary of State and is in the terms of reference is that this process include uh, legitimate representatives of the Afghan government and the Afghan people. So that's, that's the direction we're headed in. I think to look at the, uh, the negotiation at any point in time would not be, would not be probably a full sight picture. Uh, on that same subject, General, what conditions would you expect the Taliban, from the Taliban before the U.S. is safely able to withdraw from their country? Beyond the Taliban, when I make a recommendation to the Secretary and the President about our future presence in Afghanistan, it will be based on our national interests in the fact that Afghanistan is not a sanctuary from which terrorists can attack the American people, the American homeland. Okay. So, uh, Secretary, back to you. Um, if uh, uh, We've had some discussion already about the, about, um, the size and strength of the United States Navy. Even if every Congress and President agreed on the goal of a 355-ship fleet for decades to come, we still won't reach that desired goal for at least 40 years. 
What do you expect the balance of forces between the U.S. and China to be by the time we achieve a 355 fleet uh, Navy? Well, let me just speak to the, uh, the time. I think it's 2034 in which we reach the, the 355 ship Navy. The uh, discussion, you know, it's <clears throat> the future force structure won't necessarily be defined by our traditional measures of 355 ships. I mean, the real uh, work that we're undergoing right now is what is the right mix? And this goes back to, you know, autonomy, um, semi-autonomous, uh, surface, subsurface mix. I don't think the 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 course that the Chinese are on is the same course that these naval battles will be fought on in the future. The, the war fighting doctrine is gonna change dramatically. That doesn't mean that we divorce ourselves from our current infrastructure, but I, I really think that this transition to future forces, space, cyber missiles will have a profound impact on the type of Navy we have and the, the size of those vessels and the composition. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Kim. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I actually want to be able to continue on the, on the great line of questioning that my, my colleague was just uh, going through. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that we think about what the American people are worried about, how they're understanding the issues that we're dealing with with the military and with security. And what I'll tell you is that oftentimes the conversations that I have back in the district in New Jersey are different than the conversations we'll have here in this room. Uh, I, we just had, uh, heard some great line of questioning about Afghanistan. I think that's key because that is something that's always on the minds of the American people in my district when they're thinking about security. And while these other issues we have talked about are important, in this discussion here is as we're thinking about our priorities and our budget, I think it's important for us to be able to make sure we're always being proactive about explaining to the American people what we're doing in Afghanistan and what our next steps are. So I just always encourage uh, the three of you and, and others at the Pentagon and elsewhere to be thinking about how it is that we can raise those issues and, and continue to show the American people that these are not issues that we're sweeping under the rug, that we're going to stay engaged, especially after we know that there are people who are eligible to serve out in Afghanistan now who are in diapers on September 11th. You know, that is just a core reality we need to comprehend here. So I want to just bring a question back from the district to you, which is, you know, as we're going through this, what are those circumstances that we need uh, to be able to understand when we will no longer require U.S. military personnel in Afghanistan? I know that it's going to be dependent in part on the peace process and the discussion there. I understand that. Um, I also understand that the... Uh, South Asia strategy also talks a lot about how the regional countries are engaged in this. But when I think about the train, advise, and assist mission, I see a lot of parallels between where we're at right now in Afghanistan and also in Iraq with these being core elements. But I, what I don't have a sense of is when do we no longer need to have U.S. personnel on the ground to be able to help support with train, advise, and assist or other capabilities there? General? Congressman, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, and then you can come back at me with additional questions. I mean, what I would tell your constituents back in the district is that when there is no longer a threat of terrorism in South Asia uh, that would affect uh, the homeland or the American people, uh, then the mission uh, can end. And until that point, uh, you know, we if we end the mission before that condition is achieved, then that then that's the, then we'll be managing risk of an attack on the homeland from South Asia and. and I would just tell you today, given the almost 20 groups that operate in that area, and, uh, and certainly the intent, if not today, the capability of Al-Qaeda and ISIS Khorasan, it's my judgment, my military judgment, that continued pressure on those threats is directly and inextricably linked to the security of the American people. Thank you for that. When we're making that assessment of the threats, especially to the homeland, I agree with you, that should be the measure by which we understand uh, our involvement what can you tell me that, that reassures me that the Afghan Defense Forces are ones that are being able to develop to be able to do that on their own? Even if we were to get to a point where you, you or, or some other uh, general as a commander can be able to dis make that determination, if we were to then not have the Afghan forces at the capabilities where they can do that on their own, then obviously we may fall back into a situation again as we've seen over the last couple of years in Iraq. So uh, on the Afghan security forces side, what 
circumstances or what conditions do they need? What proficiencies do you need to see in their forces to give you confidence that they would be able to handle this on their own? Sure, and, and Congressman, it's, it's uh, beyond just a military issue, right? So it's the capability of the Afghan National Defense Security Forces. It's also the capability of the Afghan government to sustain uh, those particular forces. And when, w when would that happen? Uh, I guess what I would tell you is if you went back to 2013, we had 100,000 Americans on the ground, total of 140,000 NATO forces, and that was the size force that was necessary for us to advance our national interests at that time. Uh, today, uh, we have about 13,000 Americans in Afghanistan as opposed to 100,000 Americans back in 2013. So I know this isn't moving as fast as uh, the American people, and in particular your constituents, would want it to be. But what we have tried to do is make sure that the level of effort uh, that we had in Afghanistan was consistent with the threat and consistent with the capabilities of the Afghans to deal with that threat on their own. And it's our judgment today that, particularly with regard to combat enabling capability, in, uh, in high-end special operations capability, the kind of support we're providing today continues to be necessary. And I would add there's 39 other nations that are with us in, uh, in supporting the Afghans right now. No, thank you for thank that. You, I think that's incredibly important. I yield back. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My questions relate to the zero-sum decisions we seem to be making relative to our fifth generation and fourth gen fighting aircraft. My first question is whether or not the manufacturing base has been a consideration in the decision to upgrade the F-15. So I think when we looked at the factors that we talked about, there was you want to maintain a competitive industrial base. You also want to make sure you have weapon systems with the right mix of capacity and capability, and there's a mix between them. And yeah, we're going to go through the capability, right. but specifically as to the manufacturing base, is it your view that this decision to make the F-15 upgrades is essential in that the manufacturing base justifies that decision? I don't know if it justifies it by itself. I just think it's, some, it's a factor that needs to be considered. How many F-35As can we build in FY 2020? I need to get you that number. What's the, the production rate for the shed? Yeah, what's our, what's our manufacturing capacity for the aircraft that we've spent the better part of several decades getting ready to launch into the skies? We've got 78 in the budget. I don't know what their capacity is per year. Procurement cost has been another justification for the decision to purchase fewer F-35s and, and to have um, the F-15X options that have been laid out. When you finish the f 15 upgrades with the full complement of targeting pods and sensors and jammers. What's the flyaway cost? I, I don't have the specifics on flyaway costs. The life, the maintenance and operating costs of them will still be lower. I'm, I, I, we can get to that. I'm, right. First, procurement cost. Is it, it, it was an assumption we made that the procurement cost of the F-15 upgrades would be less than buying more F-35As? Uh, I believe the main driver was in the, the maintenance and the sustainment costs. The procurement costs were different, but they were not as dramatically different as the others. Which, the procurement cost of which is lower? How about that? Of the fourth generation is so, lower. So what you're telling me is it's cheaper to buy and upgrade a fourth, or a fourth gen F-15X than it is with the flyaway cost with the F-35A? I believe so. I can get you those for the record. I know we've put those numbers together for the... Uh, for the committees. I'm looking at an $80 million flyaway cost on the 35A, and then once you lash the necessary, you know, electronic weapons pod um, and, and other uh, tech to the F-15X, you're looking at a 90 to $100 million flyaway cost. Does that sound I'm not right? sure what other additional things you're attaching to. It depends on the mission you're asking it to perform. I would only the, the mission set that we would assume when we make these budgetary decisions. Mm -hmm. If you could provide for the record for me the detailed breakdown on per, not maintenance costs, procurement cost on these two weapon systems, that'd be most helpful. Sure. Um, operational cost. You were, you were making a point about that as well. Um, what's the basis for the view that the F-15X will have a lower operational cost? So there's an analysis that was done by our, our CAPE uh, organization that went through and compared the the set of them because you talked about there's the purchase cost the sustained maintenance cost, and basically the, the life cycle cost when you think of how long the aircraft lasts. And it also compares it for the different missions we need them to perform. If you're operating in a, a permissive environment where you're looking at the capacity of the ability of the plane to do strike versus where you need If you look you at a the, melded rate, what's our, on the F-15X, what, what does it cost per hour to fly it? 
I, I don't have those for me. I know that they're they're available, but I didn't bring them with okay. me to so the So as you guys provide, for the record for me, the the procurement cost breakdown mm -hmm. on the X versus the 35A, it would be really helpful to have the um, melded rate on hourly cost to fly, the 35A and the F-15X, because I'm looking at some data that says that by 2025, we're going to drive down that cost on the 35A to $25,000 per flying hour at, with a melded, understanding there are different missions, but as a melded rate, and that's a year after the budget says we would have the first operational F-15Xs, so presumably that would be a number consistent with the data that showed that to be twenty-seven to $30,000 per flying hour. So if you can break that down for me. We'd be happy to. It's one of the things yeah. we'd ask people to assemble, because following the, the briefings on the mix, these were some of the common questions, and what we wanted to do is give every one of the committees the exact same set of data so that they understood the yeah, data. Yeah, I'm a little upon surprised you don't have it. it. I mean, I, you know, because there seems to be a pretty deliberate decision to lean into the F-15X, and so I would have thought that that would be really relevant information for a budget discussion. I, I want to take my final moments to just ask uh, Secretary Shanahan, you know, can you explain the ways in which these budget priorities um, recognize the changing environment in the Western Hemisphere, Venezuela, and how we're going to make sure we support Southcom effectively? Yeah. So the, the one of the fundamental assumptions that we've been building into the, the force mix and the force design is and that if you can functional. do that in 30 seconds, that'll yeah. work, okay? Yeah, no, I'll do it even, even more quickly. We've designed this, and the chairman's been extraordinarily uh, helpful here, dynamic force employment so we can move forces quickly and reconstitute them in areas where there's a demand and to increase interoperability. That flexibility allows us then to surge in the case of SOCOM mm -hmm. when, when they have a different mission or they need to surge for a short period of time, but not to fundamentally change their footprint. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Mrs. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, thank you, General Dunsford, as, as Secretary Shanahan and uh, Mr. Norquist. Really appreciate your testimony. Uh, I want to. I know we've had a few rounds of questions, but I, I want to dig a little bit further into space realignment and priorities, uh, which I, I, I believe are really important. And to uh, uh, Mr. Kim's point uh, earlier about making sure that the public understands them, and I'm going to direct my first questions to uh, General Dunsford. Because uh, I'd like to hear uh, from you about this. Uh, it's safe to say that uh, space assets uh, exist uh, across all of the branches and all of the functions of, of our armed forces today? Uh, space capabilities exist across uh, three of the four services. All the services uh, leverage space. So, so space is a critical component of our warfighters' ability and our, our overall national security architecture. Ab absolutely critical for everything from navigation to communications to targeting. Okay. Also safe to say that uh, developing space assets uh, and, and capabilities is uh, not an easy endeavor. No, that's, that's accurate. Okay. So uh, looking at this uh, space space uh, question, uh, and, and also I, I wear another hat as the chair of the of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee uh, in, in the civilian space arena, and, and knowing that we have a, a number of additional players in space, I want to dig into a little bit of what this looks like, because uh, I think it's important for us to understand uh, both the needs, the capabilities, and, and the future development of, of this. And uh, it certainly would be my intention, and I think I've heard that from many Many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle that we make the best decisions in the best interests of our overall national security. It's not a partisan issue. It's about our current and future capabilities, understanding that this architecture is important. Um, so across across the uh, across the different programs, across the different services, um, do you do you think that it is possible that right now, and we've also talked about uh, acquisition and cost and, and audits. Uh, that there there may be programs or or uh, different uh, capabilities being uh, developed right now that are potentially duplicative or could be more efficiently utilized across a, a common architecture. I think it's entirely possible that we could be more effective and efficient in developing space capabilities, and that really is the the foundational argument for the space development agency. So. Following on with that, uh, in the interest of, of not only protecting our national security, but understanding that with additional players and hundreds of thousands of uh, pieces of space debris and 
not only our national security interests, but also commercial and our just general lives day to day, depending on it. Uh, what, General Dunsford, because we heard from you earlier, Secretary Shanahan, I appreciate that. Uh, what do you think uh, about uh, the, the model and, and the potential pathway forward? Does it, does it need to be a, a separate force or could it be more of a core model? What is your opinion uh, on that? In, in my view, uh, Congresswoman, there's really, Congresswoman, there's really two issues, right? There's the how do we best integrate joint capabilities today? And so that's been uh, heretofore described as a sub-unified command, moving to a unified command for SCASE command. That takes the force we have today. With regard to the specific organizational construct, I'm satisfied with the one that we've laid out, and I'm confident that over the next several years, it'll be refined. Uh, it'll be refined. I think the, the important thing is, in, in the current organizational construct we have uh, today uh, within the Department of the Air Force and, and within the Joint Warfighting uh, Force with, uh, with a, a Space Command, gives us the ability to first uh, train the right people, identify and train the right people, develop the right capabilities, and then when those capabilities are developed, field those capabilities in the most effective way for the warfighter. So I think we have all the pieces in place, and I think like every organization, it'll grow over time, but we ought not to seek perfection before we start to step out and, uh, and change the way we're doing business, given the importance of space. That would be my own thoughts on this. Okay. And and just to 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 go back one one more piece of this I, I appreciate your answers is in in the proposal one one thing that that caused me to raise my eyebrows there's some uh, some some changes and some exemptions uh, for employment uh, practices and, and procedures that we, that that are within this proposal and 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 it provides broad exemptions to current law I understand the need to realign as as something else is being stood up but uh, I don't understand, and I'll leave this to either one of you. The, could you explain to me the justification uh, behind these broad exemptions? So there are two types. One was set up on personnel, and that was modeled after the personnel authorities of the National Reconnaissance Office. And then there's another one that was modeled after how the Air Force did its transition to being a separate service. So those authorities are designed to be similar to other organizations, either stand up or space. It's one of the areas. I'm sorry, but yep. the lady's time has expired. The front, and I, I believe Mr. Uh, Lamborn is next. Um, go ahead. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, first, a statement, and then a question. First, for the secretary, and then for the chairman. You stated earlier, Mr. Shanahan, that if Secretary Shanahan, that if forced to prioritize between Space Force, Space Command, and the Space Development Agency, Space Command would be your first priority. Um, I would like to point out that the Space Command did exist in Colorado Springs from 1985 to 2002, and currently Air Force Space Command and the National Space Defense Center are located at Peterson and Schriever, uh, both in Colorado Springs. So if the threat is as urgent as you suggest, and I believe it is, and if time is of the essence, uh, I would highly recommend that Colorado Springs be the best location given in addition to those considerations, the massive number of space warfighters and infrastructure already in place. So I'll just go on record as uh, making that point. Uh, my question is this. Can you describe why this administration and the Department of Defense have exhibited such a sense of urgency regarding the reformation of our military space enterprise? Is it because the threat is so dangerous and so imminent? I'd just say Fundamentally, it's now a contested environment. And a $19 trillion economy and the world's most powerful military runs off space. And in that contested domain, if we don't protect it, we're all at risk. So it's really, I mean, the urgency is the, the threat that so much of what we depend on, you know, our, you know, maps in our cars, you know, the ability to, you know, target our weapons is vulnerable. And well, then what would, what would you say to someone who says, okay, well, I see a threat, yep. but can't we attack that problem within the existing structure? Uh, I know the Air Force, to their great credit, has come up with some reform proposals, mm -hmm. but um, is that enough or do we need to go beyond? Well, I think we need to go beyond. That's what the proposal represents and really the Space Development Agency, and I just, this is the part I'd emphasize, um, 
ignore the agency piece, you could call it uh, space development organization. It's about development, it's not about acquisition. You know, this is what you know, General Schriever did. This is what was done in SDIO. We need to marry up the right programmatic skills so that we can go more quickly and leverage off of com the innovation and investment in commercial space. Our acquisition rules can't accommodate that. And that's the, the restructure that we're proposing here so we can go more quickly and use the technology that already exists. So, you know, to me, waiting to tailor our current environment will just take too long. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chairman Dunford, in your professional military opinion, especially given your career as a Marine in the Department of the Navy and the importance of culture in the services, uh, can you explain the benefits that a separate military service focused on space will provide, whether as a space force or space corps, or however it's denominated and, and whatever the final details are, uh, which would not be gained by simply reforming military space within the existing structures? Sure, Congressman. In, in, in my experience, an organization that has a singular focus has responsibility for identifying people, training people, equipping people, and then delivering them to the warfighter for integration has a much better chance, particularly given the importance of space. It's one of only five domains but we have a much better chance with an organization that has that singular focus, as well as making sure that with regard to prioritization and allocation of resources, that, that we don't drain away resources that might have been used for space for other reasons. And I know being part of large organizations is always going to be that temptation. And so I think having the opportunity, and, and frankly, the, from an oversight perspective, I would see the appeal from Congress as well to make sure you have the oversight uh, that you need to have, that those resources that are ne necessary for us to be competitive in space are actually managed properly. And I know some have expressed concern about adding bureaucracy, quote unquote, or additional flag officers. Um, on the positive side, does that give more of a seat at the table, so to speak, to the folks in space, which is important? Well, I think, I think a, a senior leader who, who does sit at the table obviously has more influence. And someone asked me earlier, uh, you know, should this, member, should this person be a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff? And of course, if they're a service, then by definition, I think that would be a reasonable thing to do. But I have seen personally now over the last couple of years, particularly as a result of General Hyten uh, being in a room, that when, when he's been around, given his experience in space, the dialogue quickly shifts and we think of things that we wouldn't have otherwise thought about without him in the room. Yeah, Thank sorry, you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, just for everyone's understanding in terms of the order here, there is one confusing aspect of this. Um, basically, you're in the order that you're in when the gavel falls. If you leave, you know, you're still in order. What happens, what has been happening a lot, is people come back literally in the two to three minutes before they would be next. Under the rules, that person is then next. Now that's inconvenient because I know a lot of members are anticipating, okay, it's next and I'm next. But even if you think you're next, if somebody walks in who was there at the gavel and who is in front of you, that person is next. Personally, I'm rethinking that rule. Um, because you know, it's a little bit unfair to the people who are sort of planning on, on what's here, but that's, that's just the way it is. So if you think you're next and I wind up calling on somebody else, um, that will be because somebody else who was in front of you walked back in, and that's going to happen right now. Uh, Ms. Willihan, you're up. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a number of questions, and uh, thank you very much for your testimony today, gentlemen, Mr. Shanahan and General Dunford and Mr. Norquist. Um, I'm going to focus my questions today on the impact of the fiscal year 20 budget on our defense industrial base and our investment specifically in cybersecurity across the DOD enterprise. But before I did that, I wanted to start by echoing some of my colleagues who have uh, gone before me in their frustration with the department's interactions with Congress over the funding for the president's planned border wall. Uh, what you refer to in your remarks as, as the border situation. Um, I led a, a letter from my colleagues from Pennsylvania, sir, uh, Mr. Shanahan, to you asking if you could provide a list of uh, unawarded Milcon product projects in Pennsylvania that would be imperiled. And I also asked for that list to contain an assessment as well of the impact if those items were canceled or delayed uh, as a result of the border wall or the border situation. 
And I was really glad to receive the list of Pennsylvania projects, but I still haven't seen any sort of assessment on the impact of those projects if they were not to come to fruition in this time frame. Um, nor have I seen any questions for the record from this committee's first meeting back in January, where I asked for an assessment of the impact on border deployment on our service members' readiness. And I serve on the readiness subcommittee as well. And I would certainly have hoped that the department would have conducted an impact assessment and briefed it to the president before anyone started talking about moving this money around. And I definitely would have hoped that this information would be more readily available now coming up on three months from when we initially asked for it. Uh, there are four projects in Pennsylvania, as it turns out, that are at risk if this plan moves forward. And I wanted to just, for the sake of my time, highlight only one. Last year's appropriations bill included $71 million for the construction of a new facility in Philadelphia where we manufacture the propulsor systems for the Virginia and Columbia class submarines. The Naval Foundry and Propeller Center is essential for the design, manufacturing, and repair of propellers for the U.S. Navy. A new facility is needed to accommodate the increase in personnel and equipment that comes from the push to manufacture these new submarines. And so simply put, even though this is a propeller, we can't meet the administration's goals of a new submarine fleet without this. Last week, the Commandant of the Marine Corps wrote that, course, wrote that supporting the, quote, unplanned and unbudgeted southern border deployment was an exacerbation of an already challenging budget year for the Marine Corps. Corps. So I'll move on to my questions soon, but I just wanted to say for the record that the ill-advised plan really has significant readiness ramifications, and the American people, particularly Pennsylvanians, Pennsylvanians really deserve to know what they are, not just the list of the projects that are possible on the chopping block. And this administration has been very vocal about its frustration with Congress and its struggles to provide appropriate appropriations on time. And I think that, frankly, the criticism is very fair. But now that I'm also learning a little bit more about the, uh, the referenced kind of department reprogramming, I think it's also fair to say that that burden is not just shared by the Congress, but also by the fact that we are reappropriating money and that causes certainly uncertainty amongst the supply chain. I've heard from companies across Pennsylvania that they are struggling to hire, to train, and to retain staff, as well as to make capital investments. And so now I guess my questions to you are, did the department actually assess the impact on the defense supply chain, especially on small businesses, before deciding to move ahead with proposing these cuts and delays? And if not, why not? And if so, what were those assessments? And, and you're, you're referring to the... Uh, Military. The case and study of the four Pennsylvanian projects and yeah. what their impact would be, you know, on the supply yeah. chain uh, if we were to pull back on those uh, for small businesses and suppliers in my community, particularly. Right. I can't speak to the uh, the total assessment. I'll, I'll let uh, David Norquist comment, but I believe the project that you're referring to on the uh, uh, propeller capacity is to be awarded in July. So that would not be one of the projects that would be. Sir, it was provided to us as one of the possibilities. Right. Right, so if I could clarify, what was provided uh, to the Congress was a list of projects that had not been awarded since January of this year. And so that was the full vision of what's in the pipeline. What the Secretary has directed is to not affect any of those projects that were scheduled to be awarded before 1 October, 30 December. The reason for that is that in the budget there was a request for military construction funding in order to backfill those, so those projects would be, I know that the chairman has, has views on that, but I understand the department's intent was to make sure there wasn't an effect on the industrial base or on those facilities by ensuring that by the time you got to the next uh, year when those scheduled projects were scheduled to be awarded, there would be additional MILCON to keep them going. But my understanding is the project you specifically mentioned would not be affected under either circumstance. It, it just seems Thank you, the, but the general lady's time has expired. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I and, didn't uh, notice Mr. that. Sorry, Mason, sir. You are up. Mm. First, I want to thank you all for being here, and I uh, appreciate your leadership. Thanks for stepping forward uh, and doing this. Our country needs people to step forward and lead. Uh, my first question to, uh, revolves around readiness and modernization. You know, 26 months ago when President Trump came in, our readiness levels were the worst seen since 1977. We had 58 combat brigades, three could, in the Army, only three could deploy, that were ready to fight tonight. Half the Navy aircraft couldn't fly. Air Force pilots were getting about half the, pilot, the flying time that they needed in training. Uh, I thought it was negligent for Congress to let us get to the spot. 
and we dug up modernization hole as well uh, with some of the oldest aircraft, ships, and tanks in the history of our country when you look at the average uh, age. So since 2010 till two years ago, we cut the military budget 18%. And the last two years, we've added 60% of those cuts back in. General Dunford, Chairman, could you tell us what has been the impact of this increase on our readiness and modernization, and what happens if we don't sustain it? Thank you. Sure. Uh, Congressman, I mean, it's, it really is very simple. Number one, we're better able to meet the requirements that we have day to day. You know, I, I manage the force for the secretary, make recommendations for him on employment of the force. And so if you think about the inventory of forces that are available for day to day operations, there are more forces available. Uh, perhaps more importantly, uh, we benchmark very carefully uh, our ability to respond in the event deterrence fail, uh, fails in places like Korea or in Europe and so forth, and our ability to respond to a major contingency today is, uh, is significantly greater than it was before. So there's a lot below that, right? I mean, Air Force fixing maintainers, numbers of airplanes that are available, uh, modernization efforts that are ongoing and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's about the deliverable. It's about meeting today's requirements and then meeting our overall requirements to respond to a contingency if deterrence fails. And in both of those areas, the progress is measurable. Mr. Shanahan, I want to ask you a question about the triad. As you know, there's proposals to take us to a dyad. How just important is it to maintain the triad that we've had for 60 years? Uh, what does it do to nuclear deterrence to do away with our ICBMs? Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, maybe, maybe two comments. If something's worked well for 70 years and the environment hasn't fundamentally changed, why would we change it? The... Uh, Obsolescence is a, a fundamental issue we have to address. But more importantly, I, I think it comes down to why would we unilaterally disarm when our competitors are arming themselves? As part of that, could you tell us how important nuclear command control and communications upgrades or modernization is also needed? Yeah, well, the obsolescence of the uh, triad it's clear that we need to make those investments, and this was a little bit of the discussion we were having earlier around 5G. The nuclear man command and control communication system is so fundamentally vital, and when we think about spoofing, or we think about systems being compromised, and as we invest in a new space architecture, new terrestrial architecture, uh, we need to have total confidence in that the information that's being provided to our commanders and commanders in, in chief is completely trusted and you know this is a a new world in terms of cyber so that's probably one of the most you know critical modernization programs that we have before the department i agree uh Ch Ch chairman i got a follow-up on a question on electronic warfare you know we have five domains we don't consider the electronic magnetic spectrum as a separate domain, though it is a physical domain. All of our radio messaging goes through that. Radar uses it. But our doctrine doesn't identify the electronic magnetic spectrum domain as that. And I think it should, but I'd be curious for your military professional opinion. Should we make the electronic magnetic spectrum a separate domain? Because we want to own it and, and prevent the enemy from using it. Uh, Congressman, let me start by agreeing with you. We want to own it. Uh, and, and frankly, in the recommendation I made to the Secretary for this year's program recommendations, the electromagnetic spectrum was among the areas we highlighted. And as we do competitive area studies, that area comes back. There are a lot of critical functions inside of our war fighting capabilities that aren't in and of themselves domains. And so I, I right now am comfortable with uh, electromagnetic, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum being something we look at through the lens of a function. Mr. Chairman, I yield back, but I thank you for uh, your testimony and your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, General, uh, Mr. Nunquist, I want to thank you all for uh, taking your time. Uh, it's been a long day for you already, and thank you for, for being here. Um, I, I want to talk to you about a specific issue uh, dealing with, with California. Um, there's a, a, fight, a contract has been awarded for a, a fight, flight simulator for the 446th Airlift Wing of California's Air National Guard located at Naval Air Station Point Magoo. 
In November of last year, the insulation had to be evacuated due to wildfires, and it so happened the 146th 46 airlift wing also has been critical to combating the wildfires with its C-130J aircraft. Now, you had said earlier in your testimony that any contract that was going to be awarded after September 30th, 2019, the funding was going to be pulled. Um, you know, which this, this specific simulator, the contract has been awarded, it was going to be awarded after the date that you had mentioned. Uh, any delay of the critical flight simulator programming for the 146th airlift wing would undermine readiness and impede training for pilots combating wildfire and conducting search and rescue. Um, you know, this is a big issue for being a Californian. I know it's a big issue for Congresswoman Julia Brownlee, who it's this specifically in her district and all uh, members of Congress in California. Um, why would we cut funding for this critical flight simulator when it's so strategic to uh, the training that these pilots need in order to, to support this critical mission here in California. So the, the intention is not to, to cut funding for any of those projects. I think there's two things. First of all, just being in the pool doesn't mean that those projects are going to be selected. The Secretary hasn't made a decision yet on the use of 2808 or the authorities. The other is that we've requested money in order to ensure those projects continue. And so our hope would be that those fundings would be included in any enacted bill and allow us to ensure those essential projects go forward. You know, Secretary Shanahan, I'll say, notice in your written testimony, you wrote, our responsibility is to remain responsible stewards of your trust and the American taxpayers' hard-earned tax dollars. Congress has already funded these programs. Why would we fund them again, and how is that being responsible and watching the taxpayers' tax dollars? We're going to be responsible of managing the taxpayers' money. Absolutely. I mean, that's, the, that's my role, and you have my assurance that we're going to, in this department, take care of our people, maintain readiness, and modernize to fight future threats. But would you say making them pay for the same thing twice is being responsible with the, the taxpayers' dollars? You wouldn't go and buy a vehicle and then have the, the car dealer take it away and say, you know what, I gave it to somebody else, you're going to have right. to pay for it again. Well, we Why would we do that yeah. to the American yeah. taxpayer? Yeah. We, we haven't paid for it once yet. You know, and this is, this is the, the process that we're stepping through. And I, I think that was the, the place where we started this discussion. It's a mm -hmm. complicated situation, and it's tied to a new budget. We're really buying time so we can backfill these projects. All right. But if you're taking money away from a project that's already been funded, and then you're asking to fund that project again, it is being paid for twice. Um, but I'm going to change the topics here real quick. Um, General, um, the Commandant of the Marine Corps you know, recently made a statement about deployments down to the border and uh, f having the, you know, Fund transfers under the President's emergency declaration, among other unexpected demands, have posed unacceptable risks to the Marine Corps' combat readiness and solvency. He said they haven't been able to fund uh, other training that uh, had been planned. Um, do you agree with his assessment that sending troops, Marines, down to the border is, is hurting uh, Marine Corps readiness? Hey, Congressman, I, I would like to put that letter in full context. What the Commandant of the Marine Corps did, and I read the letter and, and spoke to this, spoke to him as well as the Secretary of Navy about it, uh, he listed a number of uh, unanticipated bills that the Marine Corps was confronted with in this fiscal year, one of which was the southwest border. Those bills in the aggregate created difficulties for him in funding other, uh, other priorities, and that really was what it was about. It wasn't a letter. This particular letter wasn't a letter about the southwest border and didn't single out the southwest border deployment as being the issue. It, it, it identified the southwest border as one of the unfunded, one of the and unanticipated bills. The gentleman's time has expired. We, votes coming up, they're estimating sometime between now and the top of the hour. Um, we will go uh, until 10 minutes after the votes are called um, at the most, and then we'll be done. Mr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, Secretary uh, Shanahan and uh, 
Chairman Dunford, many of your predecessors have touted our nuclear enterprise as a, if not the top priority within the Department of Defense. Do you agree with this? It's our singular most important mission. I'm on, I'm on record saying the same many times. Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Um, then, uh, Chairman Dunford, do you also believe then it's important to advance our low yield nuclear weapons system? I do, Congressman, and I can explain that if you if you want me to explain the reason why. Uh, Maybe just uh, yes, please. It would probably be hard to do it. In, oh, in, okay, in, but uh, I'd be happy to answer that question uh, when the time you know for the record or whatever, because I, I do feel like that low yield option is critical for deterrence. Okay, um, what uh, does this budget do to accelerate U.S. development of hypersonic weapons? Let me get you. Let me get you the number. We've accelerated the hypersonic testing and deployment several years with this budget. Uh, it's an extra $2.6 in this, uh, this year's top line. Okay. And do you think that it's on a, an appropriate and comfortable pace considering our adversaries' advancements? Well, I'd like to be a bit further along, but th this is a, a much faster pace than we've had in the last couple of years. Okay. Uh, Chairman Dunford. Many of the Department of Energy's nuclear weapons support facilities are over 40 years old and are in need of refurbishment. Uh, how important is a modern Department of Energy nuclear weapons development capability to your ability to provide a credible nuclear deterrence? They're inextricably linked, Congressman. Okay. Um, Secretary Shanahan, um, what do you foresee the National Guard's role being in the Space Force? That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, we've had a we've had a lot of debate, and General Lengel has been at the at the center of that debate. Uh, there's some complexities about how those resources align, and how their training and support is conducted today. But as as they do in so many other uh, elements of the uh, total force, they'll play a critical role. It's, it's the question today more is around how do we organize them than it is the importance of their role. Okay. And I'm going to give two minutes back, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Good, more, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. Thank you also for your service, uh, what you do for the men and women in uniform, as well as for the entire country. Thank you. Uh, as we discuss the $750 billion national defense budget, I speak for many of my colleagues on uh, both sides of the aisle. Uh, when I express my deep concern regarding the Department of Defense failure to proactively address PFAS cont contaminants on and around military establishments, I deeply appreciate Congressman Bergman bringing this up and uh, your comments that Sec Acting Secretary she Shanahan that the EPA is working to address those standards. Meanwhile, you are merely working to eliminate use of PFAS uh, underscores that this response is wholly insufficient. I sincerely hope that the department hears the concerns of my colleagues and stops hiding behind bureaucratic and regulatory red tape to avoid helping communities clean up PFAS contaminants. To that end, Act Acting Secretary Shanahan, two weeks ago when you testified before SASC, Senator Heinrich asked if you read a New York Times article titled, Pentagon Pushes for Weaker Standards on Chemicals Contaminating Drinking Water. Have you had the opportunity to read that article? Yes, I have. Thank you. Can you please speak on Senator Heinrich's second question as well? Is the article accurate, and is the Pentagon pushing the Trump administration to adopt weaker standards for groundwater pollution caused by PFAS and other chemicals? The, the article is not accurate, and the Department of Defense is not asking for the standard to be lowered. Thank you. I hope that your actions will also reflect the importance of this issue. Yep. Thank you. I want to close by re reiterating what Senator Heinrich said to you. I know there is a right way to do this. It is to follow the science. The right way to do this is not to set a standard that is based on trying to limit liability. I yield the remainder of my time. Ms. Hill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
Acting Secretary Shanahan, the President's uh, fiscal year 20 budget request has a $600 million decline in funding for the European Defense Initiative. Yet in your testimony today, you noted that Russia last year conducted its largest military exercise in almost 40 years and is escalating intimidation efforts. What's the rationale for reducing this funding when there's, already, when there's an increasingly hostile actor next door and our own national defense strategy says that Russia is one of our two biggest concerns? I'll ask the, the comptroller to walk you through the numbers, but fundamentally what it represents is that yeah. the standing up of the initiative, so I think of it as either the setup costs or the non-recurring costs are complete, and now it's really about sustaining the level of effort and conducting more exercises and actually deploying uh, more troops. David. Correct. So the amount we're investing in presence and putting folks is, is up $170 million. The amount we're spending on training is up $300 million. What's down is the pre-positioning of equipment, because once the equipment's been moved into place, you don't need to keep paying for it. So while the cost is coming down, the actual level of activity is going up. Thank you. Um, so do we have, is, does this have anything to do with the fact that European countries are filling some of those gaps, or is this, is, do you have any, do you have any sense that this will affect uh, our position in any way? Well, I think they're filling gaps and they'll fill fill more gaps, particularly with the, you know, initiative to have, you know, uh, more, more battalions, um, you know, more uh, uh, battleships to be able to deploy more quickly, the 430s initiative. We also are conducting, you know, more exercises with NATO. So I think uh, what you're saying is just more of the front end flow of money, especially from NATO, starting to get to the front line. This is, you know, for NATO, you know, what I think we'll see with their uptick in investment is more capability and capacity coming online. What you're seeing with the European Defense Initiative is the U.S. leading the integration and conducting higher level exercises. Thank you. Um, so can you give some specific examples of where the, where NATO is filling those those gaps are, are increasing? I'll, I'll take that for the record, but you know, I've, I've seen some of those plans. I've seen some of the contributions that, that they're making to increase capability, as well as the exercises that we have organized so that uh, we're, we're conducting more sophisticated exercises like Trident Juncture, but let me take that for the record and, and provide you an update. Do you have any concerns about the signals this might send to our allies and partners in Europe, considering the, the comments that are coming from this administration and our president, the, the ridicule for NATO and uh, the, you know, the proposed cuts, that the signals that, that might send to Putin and to our, our partners and allies? I've, I've had, probably since I've been in this position, maybe 50 conversations with my counterparts in, in NATO. and. It's really been the opposite. They're more engaged. They have a strong sense of leaning forward into these exercises, and I think they're more encouraged by our participation and presence in Europe today. Oh, I had I had different conversations when I was in Europe for the uh, for the Munich conference, and it se it seemed like the tone was a bit uh, a bit more insecure. <laughs> But I'm curious why, why you feel like that's the case. Well, this is, and so I think about the defense ministers. I'm not, I don't know um, who you were speaking with, but this was the defense ministers as we're doing the, the planning. And it wasn't just in terms of uh, the, the NATO exercises there. This also had to do with our activity in Afghanistan. But in particular around NATO, and I, I think the best evidence of, of support was now, their, their unanimous support to the um, our withdrawal from the INF. It was uh, writ large in terms of, of um, supporting, uh, supporting our position. But the side conversations uh, to, the, to the person is, thank you for pushing us. Uh, we look forward to the, the exercises because the exercises that we've been conducting have been very successful. General Dunford, do you have any comments on this? The only thing I would say, Congresswoman, is, um, you know, other nations are contributing more, but no nation has increased its commitment to NATO more than the United States since 2015. So the European Defense Initiative, the addition of the Second Fleet, 
uh, down at Norfolk to ensure the transatlantic link, uh, the increased intelligence people we provided to the Southern Hub and so forth. I would just tell you, my, my peers understand that the United States of America is still the most significant contributor to NATO and the most significant contributor to the deterrence in the defense that NATO provides. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Holland. Mm. Ms. Holland will be last. Uh, Thank you. Votes. Mm. Thank you, Chairman. Mm. Thank you. Um, Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. I appreciate your time uh, immensely. I'd like to just sort of um, continue the comments of my esteemed colleague from New Mexico uh, in a different way, I guess. I'll ask a few different questions, but it's concerning the contamination um, of military installations. The FY20 budget request contains $1.1 billion for environmental restoration down from the FY19 enacted amount of $1.24 billion. In my district, the fuel spill on Kirtland Air Force Base, which resulted in 24 million gallons of jet fuel contaminating our ground soil and threatening Albuquerque's clean drinking water, has yet to be properly cleaned. At other bases in New Mexico and many other DOD installations throughout the country, dangerous levels of PFAS have been found in drinking water, and this contamination seeks to ruin people's lives. Uh, given the scale of these and other environmental issues at DOD installations, please explain how the DOD's environmental restoration efforts will address public and environmental health and safety and your rationale for the decreased budget request. And I'll add that you testified uh, earlier about uh, the money you essentially saved on, on not having to spend it on military personnel, uh, which is, you know, which, you, which everybody wants to, you know, see go toward the wall. And I'm asking why not spend money on cleaning up contamination that the military has caused? So the, the number, let me make sure I have the right here is for the environmental restoration we have uh, I need, I'm not able to follow here so let me double check the environmental my understanding was that the program is relatively flat but I will double check there sometimes we get congressional ads that raise the 19 enacted so even when we're the same number from year to year you can see that trend I think when it comes to the the contamination concerns you raised about you know we have three priorities first is to protect make sure people are drinking safe water the second one is our responsibility to remediate those that are related to the defense establishment and our operations. And the third is to research alternatives. The secretary talked about this in his comments, which is finding alternatives to be able to reduce our use of those contaminants as well at the same time we're doing the cleanup. And so you feel that by spending uh, less money on environmental restoration, you can essentially achieve those ends? I don't think we're looking to saying? reduce our investment in this area. Okay, thank you. Uh, last, uh, I'm going to switch gears over to uh, transgender troops. Do you agree with me that the United States is stronger and safer when our military reflects our nation's diversity and upholds the constitutional belief that all people are created equal? General, Secretary? Uh, Congresswoman, I couldn't agree more. Okay. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you agree with me that the administration's current policy of obstructing transgender individuals' freedom to serve in the United States military essentially makes a mockery of this commitment? Yeah. Congressman, just to be clear, the, the, the current policy that's in place uh, that was signed in 2017 allows transgenders to serve uh, in the U.S. military. So they can serve freely right now? Today they can. Okay, very good. Um, and uh, I've heard that, I mean, an argument is put forth that, you know, spending is a concern, that they, that we don't want taxpayer money spent on uh, gender dysphoria issues such as psychotherapy, prescriptions, surgeries, and so forth. Um, and I just want you to know that we realize that that portion of the budget is minuscule in comparison to other things like, for example, erectile dysfunction, which took $84 million out of the DOD budget. So I just want you to know that um, uh, I, I support wholeheartedly every single uh, 
American who wants to serve in our military, that they have an opportunity to do so, and that um, with respect to budgets, uh, knowing that it's a minuscule amount that is spent on transgender troops, uh, I don't think that is anything that should dissuade them or us from, from their service. And I yield my time, Thank Chairman. Thank you. And if I could just um, follow up on that just briefly. Um, it, it, it's a bit, the, the policy that was just announced by the administration um, through the DOD is, is a bit more complicated. Um, the Secretary and I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, and I, I don't think it is the correct policy. Um, it is not a blanket ban on people who are transgender from serving in the military. It does, however, make it very difficult for people, depending on where they're at, um, in terms of are they in the service, are they trying to join, have they had transition surgery, all of those things have really, really complicated the ability of transgender people to serve in the military. And I also feel that the policy, as announced, does not accurately reflect um, the, well, the medical facts. Um, but we will, we will be dealing with that um, later, and I understand um, you have struggled to try and try and get the right policy there. Uh, but it is considerably more complicated uh, than, than even I thought at first glance. Uh, but I don't think right now the policy uh, meets the standards that Ms. Holland was hoping to have in terms of allowing diverse people to serve, assuming that they're qualified, assuming that they can meet um, the qualifications for whatever uh, job it is they're supposed to do in the military. Um, Stormberry, do you have anything quickly? Uh, I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the presence of the Secretary and Chairman and the Comptroller, I just want to note that while we've been meeting today, uh, Andy Marshall has passed away. Oh. Uh, he, he ran the Office of Net Assessment from the Nixon administration to the Obama administration. I can think of fewer people who have had a bigger impact on focusing our defense efforts, our national security, in the right direction than, than Mr. Marshall. And we, we talk about a lot of stuff today, but uh, I think as General Dunford started out, it's about people. Some of them are not even in uniform, but, but uh, it is a remarkable life. Uh, he has been before our committee, I don't know how many times over the over the years so I wanted to note um, that that passing uh, and but also to, to honor his memory because he made such a difference and I think that is a very appropriate note to end on uh, we are adjourned I thank you gentlemen